Lounging about, just take it with you. Oh, that you is can very do what cool. you like. This is a very cool setup. I'm, I'm loving it. Thank you very Hand much. Hand built. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a. Are you happy with focuses and everything, Aiden? Yes. He might. Aiden might come and move us or do something or change something if he feels like the cameras need changing or whatever. So just if he wanders in, don't worry. Yeah, I built this. Um, Literally just as a garage, because obviously in these new build homes, there's no storage. And as we keep having children, and there's another one and there's another one, <laughs> as you know, stuff comes in the house and it doesn't seem to leave the house as quickly as it comes in. No. And there's just nowhere to put anything. So I just thought, you know, I'll just put a couple of walls here and we'll just use this as a garage, which is what we did. But then it turned into a bit of a gym, like a home gym. And then it became like a, re not a recording studio, but like a rehearsal space. And then eventually this. So we kind of arrived at this, which is all kind of, yeah, it's kind of worked out just right, really. It has, yeah. It looks cool. It's an uh, inviting space. You, I checked out the podcast before I came on, too, so I mm -hmm. saw some of, them of the topics. So yeah. um, I think one was baby carrying oh, or yeah. Yeah, yeah. forest school type stuff, yeah, yeah. which kind of goes along with everything we've been doing as a family. Right. Uh, the original idea was self-sufficiency. Yeah. And that was before we even had our kids. Right. It was like low eco footprint, things like that. Those terms started coming up a little bit. Um, and I worked at a place across the street from my house. So I got rid of my car and no TV. I had no TV for three years. Powerful. These are powerful early signs that you're, you're no TV is something that the world needs right now. <laughs> It is badly. The, There's a water there for you as well, Shannon. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna need that. Um, I'm so sure that this needs to go down a little, and maybe me over. That's all right. Keep it out there. Um, so when I had no TV, it started because I worked on a cruise ship, and it was in 2005. And back then, you didn't really have mobile internet on a boat in the middle of the water. Mm -hmm. It just, it didn't exist. No television, no satellite. Um, I worked there for a year. And when I got home, I got an apartment and just didn't buy a television. That's great. Did you find that if you ever went anywhere and you put like the television on, you know, um, that you realized what a load of fucking mad shit that was going in my head for all those years? Because that's what happened to me. Um, current events was a really big deal. So I missed out on a lot of like important current events. So Hurricane Katrina happened while I was on the ship. Right. And we did not know until we got into port and got out onto land, like what had actually happened right. in our own country. Mm -hmm. And some strange things too. Like I found out that my... President shot my vice president on a hunting trip. Oh, wow. Which president would that have been? Bush, seen, Bush Jr. was in office. I think it was Bush Jr. It was a hunting accident. <laughs> I think I remember something, actually. That rings a bell. And, uh, but it was so bizarre to hear that secondhand from a person cool. and have not had any media to tell it to you. Yeah. Which was quite interesting for me coming off that boat and sort of getting all these tidbits of information that happened over the course of an entire year. Yeah, like you've been dissing. Yeah, a bit like when all these reality shows started and people went in, or in prisons and stuff once upon a time, you know, when you just didn't have any knowledge of what was going on outside. It's like you're in a time space capsule. Yeah, it was. And um, I learned a lot of really, like, valuable lessons working on the boat. I was very young. And when I got off, I had been working with these orphans in Panama and Guatemala. And I saw a man in LA buy steak, filet mignon steak for two Doberman pincers in wow. his convertible Mercedes. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's one end of the spectrum, isn't it? 
Yeah, so I mean, I was down there, I was working, it was a luxury cruise ship. I saw all the people with all the money. But then I also saw this extreme poverty. Mm. The dogs that run around homeless. Yep. Yep. The children that make pencils last an entire year, like their only pencil. It's um, it's an awakening experience. Mm-hmm. And I was very young. I was 20. Wow. 20 years old. And mm-hmm. I met my husband in Belize while I was working on the ship. Okay. I took him with me to L.A. And then we backpacked to New Orleans, which is where when the hurricane happened. We thought we were going to go help with the relief effort. Right. But we were 20 with backpacks. And that helps no one. Of course. It just doesn't. So we planted a garden. And that was the most we could do, really, is clean stuff up. Um, We went in the February following the hurricane. So there was no relief effort yet. Right. Like, they hadn't even sent people in yet. Right, I'm with you. We had to actually climb over debris to get to our youth hostel. So it was just empty. Jesus, that must have been quite affirming as well, seeing all that and arriving at that. Seeing the French Quarter completely empty was the most bizarre feeling of people that weren't there. Right. And so that was interesting, and my husband thought that was absolutely crazy. He's British, so for him that was quite an experience, too, Mm -hmm. and we have pictures with the waterline and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I took him to meet Grandma. (laughs) Well, I tell you what, Shannon, let me introduce you and let's go back to the start because I know um, through my wife who's spent time with you, you know, she said to me, you've got to meet Shannon. She's so interesting. She's had a crazy ride and <laughs> yeah, I would yeah. love for you to meet and we've connected and you're here. And um, so welcome to Chew the Chat podcast, Shannon Folgate. It's lovely to have you. You are an American lady living in a UK and as we allude to, you've got a, 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 a crazy story crazy story yeah and as we yeah. so often do i'm fascinated just to give you a little bit of you know back back sort of um catalog on the, on the podcast i love finding out about childhood i love finding out about the trajectory that gets set you know because it seems to me in my experience at least what happens there often can dictate you know how things go where things go and how we then perceive our worlds so where in the u.s were you born how and what what, what was the story? I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1985. Um, and then I moved around a lot. And I really don't know much about my life before I was two years old. My dad went to work on roller coasters in Venezuela. And my mom traveled with the carnival. Wow. So I was in a trailer traveling in the carnival. Um And it was not very nice. I'm not going to lie. I got taken away. My brother didn't survive. Whoa. So my dad came from Venezuela, got me, took me to his hometown in Detroit, and that's where I grew up. So when you say you move around with your mom in the carnival, what's the situation there then? Is that She ran rides in the carnival. Right. Like proper carnies that just well, almost traveled like, the country. Yeah, like and, gypsies, like the gypsies do here. Yeah, yeah, but like fairs, fair right, rides. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my dad built roller coasters. That's how they met. She did the fair rides and traveled around. She eventually settled in New Mexico and went to hairdressing school, I think. Right. I haven't talked to her enough since I was four. Really? I think. No, I called her once. I called her once when I graduated high school. So you, you're removed from your mom yeah absolutely at four no i was removed at two and a half two and a half Mm -hmm. and what are the circumstances surrounding that then is it just just she she's not there hid the abuse that was going on to me and my brother particularly my brother and he was abused very badly by her boyfriend and he was murdered and she hid it So she went to prison, and that's when I went into the foster care system. Went to prison. Oh, my God. I know you find that very shocking, and people wonder why I'm so calm sometimes about it. And it's because 
when you've lived with it your entire life, you've processed it, you've dealt with it, it's not a shock to you anymore. I'm 35. Mm. That's mm. a good, you know, long yeah, you, time to live with something. Yeah, and you're a mother yourself now. But as I mm-hmm. mentioned there, you know, for me, my fascination with childhood and these things that we take for granted you know just security safety love you know we don't have to have all the money in the world but if we're together if we want to be together if we enjoy one another to be in a situation like that i mean do you have memories of your mum you know no. was, was your mum maternal in any way i have no it? idea i can't remember her i can remember my brother um ricky and We were in a bad neighborhood and somebody broke in one time and he hid me under a table. And my dad was visiting, so that's all I can really remember. But I was only two and a half. So would your brother have been older than you then? He was. He was four when I was two. uh, Birthday was 81, 82. Okay. 81, 1981. And he was murdered? He was, yeah. Yeah, he was beaten to death. (sighs) Jesus, man. And were, um, you, were you around at that point? I was. No one has ever told me where I was, what happened to me. I looked it all up in news articles. I found the news articles from New Mexico where it happened, and it said it was the worst case of child abuse in 20 years. And that's your, mo- your mother's boyfriend? He was babysitting us while she went to school. Oh, man. And you've never really been able to talk to your mum about it or you haven't wanted to? or it's just... I did. I did when I was 18. So the first thing I did when I was 18 was I bought a bus ticket to Wisconsin, to Milwaukee, where I was born, where my great-grandmother was in a nursing home. And I went and spent two weeks in the nursing home with her. Mm-hmm. I went and met my grandparents because they tried to kidnap me during the court hearing for my dad to get custody, apparently. And then they never spoke to me again after that. So this is my mother's, my maternal grandparents. Mm. They were the strangest people I ever met. Really? Absolutely. It, why? What, just principles or traditions or just the way of seeing the world? I mean, I was 18 and I sat in this chair across the room from your, what are meant to be my grandparents. Your family, yeah. And they're all the way across the room. And they don't move the whole time and I have no idea what to say to them and it was the most awkward experience of my life and they said oh you can come for the summer next year if you want thanks for visiting us and that was I was like okay that cleared up nothing for me so like really formal and really formal really no intimacy whatsoever no love no connection so you, you didn't get to dig into kind of I did I asked the deep questions I asked the really deep questions, like the ones that I wanted to know at the time were, why didn't you ever come visit me? And it was, we weren't sure if you wanted us to, or if your family wanted us to. Mm. Adults in those situations overcomplicate them so much for the children in divorce situations, trauma situations. Really, the kid just wants to know the truth, Mm. A, Mm. and see the people that were involved and hear both sides. Mm. Yeah. And that didn't happen for me. So there were always a lot of questions. So I went out to find the answers when I was 18. I visited my brother's grave for the first time in my life. And that was like a confirmation of his death. I don't remember the funeral. I don't remember grieving. No. So I got to go do that, go put flowers on his grave. And spend time with my great grandmother that I loved dearly, that I used to play rummy with as a kid. Mm. So that was quite a great experience at a very young age. And I earned all the money myself working at an Indian restaurant as a waitress, serving. So you could save up and go and make that, that journey. Yeah. I knew her time was coming soon. Mm. Um, and she actually died on my graduation party. I got the phone call the y- day. Your great gran. My great gran. Yeah. And is that your paternal, maternal? Maternal great-grandmother. Maternal great-grandmother. Yeah. So did you, you, did you get any insight as to what your mum's upbringing was like? From what I know, yeah. When I spoke to her, when I, she, when I was 18, um, I spoke to her. Your mum. And apparently her upbringing was just awful as well. Lots of abuse. Mm. And her mother actually taught her to lie about abuse. Which is why I think she lied and hid abuse. If you're taught that from the day you're born, 
how do you break those chain links? Mm. And if you go back years and years, people didn't talk about this stuff, not openly, mm. not bluntly. And you certainly didn't bring any discredit to your family. Yep. So it's a failure on multiple levels across society of being very secretive, not giving people the community and support they need. I think she was failed as a child to get the support that she needed. And that has long term effects of, of, you know, a psychological breakdown of sorts. She's still not well now. And why would she want to speak to me? God, the pain, like the buildup of pain. And, and I'm just trying to put myself in your grandparents' position as well. That kind of, and you, you, you quite rightly say, you know, that we do complicate it, but I can see that point of view as well, where like you would feel responsible in some way. And therefore, are you pushing too far to then feel like you've got a, 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 a you know, some kind of, I don't know, um, ability to be part of something that you might have played a part in I don't, it's complicated and it must be painful and we carry this don't we we go through life carrying this stuff i think that's why she and i still don't speak is i'm literally a reminder of the most tragic time of her life mm. and she i'm sure feels guilt survivor's guilt is one thing i had to learn to deal with too why was it my brother and not me mm -hmm. i was younger i was a girl i was more vulnerable technically Mm -hmm. Why was it not me? Mm -hmm. But um, a really amazing thing happened, actually. I had a very, very difficult labor and delivery with my first child. Okay. Four days of labor, which was just not funny. No. By day three. No. Um, but she was born on my brother's birthday. Your mom? My daughter. Oh, your daughter. So your daughter's born on your brother's birthday. She sure was. That's a twist of fate, isn't it? And for me, it could be nothing astrological. Somebody might have the answer for that. But it it Excuse brought me. a little bit of, um, like, hope that I have a connection with him through that. And I get to celebrate her birthday and think of him on that day. Mm -hmm. And that's quite special. That's it's extremely special. And I love the way that you look at it that way as well. I, I think, I mean, we've been talking for seven minutes. Something, <laughs> I'm like, you know, you're feeling you just came in the studio shannon and as when i spoke to you on the phone and as my wife said to me oh you've got to meet shannon she's like i mean my wife is a geordie and in england you know northern girls are like then <laughs> it's easy for them to just speak and fight. she was like <laughs> shannon's just like <laughs> and the positivity that you've managed to um ooze you know and by that i don't just mean Everything's great. I just mean oh, like, you're it wasn't smiley. Always like you're that. a smiley person. You've got a warmth to you immediately. And That's listening new. to this is like, whoa. The the happiness is new, actually. That's something I've been working on for a really long time. And it took a good eight years, really. Eight years to get where I am now. Okay. Instead of feeling broken, sad, and in pain, mostly. So when you move and you're you're removed at, at two, two and a half, mm -hmm. where do you go at that point? I go to Detroit. I go to, where well, actually from? Livonia is the name of the city. And that's where my other grandmother lives, my paternal grandmother. Yep. And she is a professional clown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your face. Just a picture then. So it was very no, I'm, I'm not see, even kidding you. She is her name is Flutterby. And she went to clown college at like 35 years old and became a professional clown. And she made money. Right. And she traveled the world. And she performed at the White House for Bill Clinton. Really? Yes. And she performed at my school and I was the coolest kid until I was eight. And then I started getting a lot of flack when I was about eight. Right. Nine, ten right. in Detroit. It's quite a rough area. Kids yep. grow up fast. Yep. If your grandmother is a clown and rocks up like that, you're not that popular right, in middle school. Yeah. Um, and I was in the circus with her when I was fifteen. Right. Let's slow down. <laughs> so. So I move in with her and my dad. You go to Detroit with your dad, yeah. essentially. Yeah, yeah, with my dad. So how do you get on with your dad, and how has your dad taken all of this news? And is your dad your brother's oh. dad? I'm, I'm guessing as well. So 
My brother was not my dad's son biologically, but right. my dad did look after him as his own. Right. I have no idea who his father was. Uh -huh. He was never in the picture, ever. Um, my dad is the only one that sort of took responsibility for me and my brother. Mm -hmm. um, and then my dad came and got me. And with the help of his mother and my stepmother, Margot, who adopted me, a two and a half year old with attachment disorder and loads of troubles, that poor woman, honestly, mm -hmm. bless her heart. She's got the patience of a saint, really, because I was a difficult child after going through all of oh, that. God, I can't even imagine. And then in the late 80s, of course, there was nothing for a five year old girl going to school that had like extreme trauma they put it down to all sorts i was misdiagnosed repeatedly through my life and that's a very common thing for children like me mm -hmm. so the trauma causes severe ptsd and attachment disorder and it, they did not know that then so i was a handful mm -hmm. so bless her heart i lived with her my dad and my grandmothers both my stepmother's mother we called her Gay Gay yep. and Nana, my dad's mother. Mm -hmm. Gay Gay and Nana, I would say, are the two matriarchal women in my life who raised me for the longest amount of time. Yep. Gay Gay had me when I was a little girl, and then Nana had me when I was a big girl. Mm -hmm. And I, that was kind of the divide. So those are the parents in my life, really, is those two grandmothers. And what, what was your relationship like with your dad then? Are you ready? <laughs> okay. I think so. My dad is the next can of worms. Right. Okay. So my uncle committed suicide in 1984. Your dad's brother. Sure is. And my uncle Howard had a horrific accident in the military and killed his best friend, from what I know, or something happened. And that gave him a horrific PTSD. Horrific PTSD, and he killed himself within a year of being discharged after getting no support. Mm. That's such a common story, that no support bit. Um, it was awful, and my dad lost Uncle Howard in 84, had me in 85, and then lost my brother 87. So my dad went through an mm. absolutely immense trauma and then had a two-and-a-half-year-old difficult child and a mother that was also grieving, which mm. led to him becoming a serious drug addict, mm. an alcoholic. Right. Absolutely. If you think the worst-case scenario, mm. that was my dad. Wow. So I grew up in my grandma's basement in the middle of the ghetto in Detroit until I was 15. Fucking hell. So, you mentioned your nana. Yeah. She became a clown around 35. Yeah. And she's picking you up from little school, and it's all That's good. That's big school. That's when I'm in big school. That's when you're in big school. Yeah, oh, right. I lived so with she... nana from 14, from 8th grade until 11th grade. Right. So. And it was a huge change, dramatic change. So, I came from... Westwood, eight mile in Detroit. Yeah, that's we were aware of that through Mr. Yeah. Eminem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up on. I grew up in a worse bit than where he was from. If you go down on Evergreen, where I was from, it was a war zone. I look at it like a war zone now as an adult. And when I live over here in England, and school moms find out that we used to run from gunshots and hide in the bushes as kids. They look at you, you like you're crazy. They're like, what? Well, for us, you know, us Brits, America and its cultural influence through movie, through film, you know, through um, it's just wide reach with its expressive drama and its art, you know. And to us, this small island, although we've got the imperial history and all the rest of it, for a lot of people, there is this kind of otherworldly exotic nature of the American juggernaut, you know. And the idea that, you know, you are living in a trailer, I guess. Is it a trailer situation no. when you're in Detroit? In, in, no? Uh, no, my grandma bought 
a house with her husband. Mm-hmm. He came back from the war and they bought the house brand new. Oh, okay. And when they bought it and raised my stepmother and her two sisters, it was a beautiful neighborhood. It was lovely. It was a cheap neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the problems in America are very similar to here. So the social housing situation, they put social housing all in the same area. Right. Let's and then see. that area becomes, like, poverty-stricken. Yes. And then the schools are poverty-stricken. And then people there are literally doomed to poverty. Mm. There's no opportunity. Mm. There's nothing you can do. The houses there are falling apart now. You can buy a whole block of them for, like, $1,000. I've read this, yeah. I read some really interesting stuff about what was happening in the Detroit. It's like, whoa. What? It's, it's like the city that was forgotten. A little bit yes and no. So we do have, like, the old industrial city that was totally forgotten. Yeah. And it's not going to work. But they rebuilt it on the waterfront. And they rebuilt, like, a lot of stages, sports, sport arenas, that type of stuff, restaurants, casinos, bars. It's beautiful. Fountains that spray Mm -hmm. up all over. And across the river is Windsor. And you can see the Windsor skyline. Nice. In Canada. And you can go across the bridge, which we particularly like to do when we're underage, to drink alcohol. Oh, so we hop over the bridge because it takes 20 minutes, get a cheap motel room, stay the night, and then head back the next day after a night out clubbing. Okay. So we're moving towards, you're, you're, you're in middle school, you're, you're, you know, you're 15, 16. Oh, we never go that young because, of course, it's 21 in America to drink. Yes. Uh, but it's 19 across the border. Yeah. Well, where so, I'm going is where, uh, where you're 15, 16, and yeah. you're, you're sort of, you mentioned... There's gunshots in the neighborhood, you know, you're getting to grips with the two matriarchs, I guess. You've just sort of gone from one to the other and you're now with Nana. Nana. Yeah. And you're adapting and school life gets a bit tricky at this point, do you say? Oh, yeah, it was it was always tricky. So when you come from a very rough background like that, it's almost obvious to the people around you and you don't necessarily cope with the situations at school that well. Mm. Um, and also I came from this all black neighborhood where I got my hair braided on the front porch and I moved to a 98% white neighborhood. Like there, it, I stood out. Mm-hmm. I didn't talk the same way. I didn't look the same way. I didn't have the same style or dance the same way. Is this with the white people? Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? I felt foreign. Yeah. But with my own color group. That's weird. And how were you accepted in the black community? Yes and no. Most of the people were like family. We had a group of children that lived on the same road as us. None of us were really allowed to go any further than like one street over and all the moms had to know. Um, We didn't know we were any different really growing Mm. up. We played baseball Mm -hmm. on the front lawn. We played basketball at St. Suzanne, the church down the street. Mm -hmm. We rode our bikes played hopscotch, you know. It was a normal kid's upbringing, but we also did get our hair braided on the front porch mm-hmm. like all the other girls and mm-hmm. get cornrows and mm-hmm. do booty popping yeah. as you do some, I don't, yeah. what do they call it now, twerking. Twerking, yeah. Well, it was popping in the 90s, I okay. I prefer popping, popping's better. And, and it was to the Tootsie Roll, which was far better music anyway. <laughs> so that was, a, that was, it was a shock going to an all white community and the girls did not like me. They were kind of scared of me. Right. And I was like, you're so close minded. You've never even been out of your own city. You don't know anything. Like, mm. Mm. Um, so you're growing up fast in many ways, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That changed that dramatic change and seeing the dramatic change and then seeing Black Lives Matter this year. Yeah. And seeing both sides of that coin so vividly through my whole life. It's mm. um, definitely eye-opening, mm. definitely eye-opening to see what it was like. I was so blessed and lucky to move. So I got a better education, like way better education. I had better opportunities. I got to join teams that I would not have had those mentors and supports mm. of certain teachers and coaches that drove me to become the person I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I would have stayed in the ghetto, that would not have happened. Mm. I got lucky. Mm. My science teacher, wonderful woman, we wrote letters after I graduated. 
Right. Stayed in contact in that bond. Yeah. Mrs. Kept... Maybe, the science teacher. Mrs. Maybe. Oh, what a fucking great name. <laughs> She's brilliant. Mrs. Maybe. Yeah, she was brilliant. So I, I was a slacker a little bit. I had to work, though. So I started working at 14 at a restaurant, a little Greek restaurant, um, bussing tables. You're allowed to start at 14 and nine months, but you have to get a paper signed by your parent, and you're only allowed to work a certain amount of hours. Um, so I did that, and then as soon as I was 16, you're allowed to work more hours, and you're allowed to get your license and do all those things. So I started working a lot mm -hmm. at 16 as much as I could, waiting tables at a diner like in the evenings after school. Mm -hmm. And I was a part of the diving team. That okay. was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what, springboard. So, what, like Olympic diving, kind of somersaulting and yeah, yeah. the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. How did you? How did you? Be, how did that come around then? Uh, Were you a good swimmer? Well, how, how did? How does that? How do you work out that you're really good at fish. diving? I've always been a fish. And in eighth grade, I had a best friend, Michelle Quinn, and Michelle Quinn joined the diving team, and we met boys at camp, and we were jumping off the dockies and. And showing off, and I, I had to show off, and I had done quite a lot of gymnastics, so mm. I was doing back dives, and she's like, oh, you should join the team, so I did. Oh, so you got a bit of pedigree in the old gymnastics, and you, you're brave enough to throw yourself around a bit and stuff. I am. So the gymnastics I just watched on, B, um, similar to BBC, our yeah. version, yeah. the like Detroit educational television programs i would watch all the gymnasts and figure skaters and just copy whatever they did growing yeah. up wow so um yeah i did and then but when i moved in with nana i had all these opportunities so i got to take gymnastics as an actual class in school with equipment and get trained mm. and that was awesome mm. i always wanted to do that and i mm. finally got to um i got my letter do you know what a letter is i don't think british people really get it no come on then so you get a fabric letter, like a big letter, and you get a big leather coat for high school, and you get your letter oh, sewn I onto it. Oh, I see them all the time, yeah. So is that yeah, what yeah, that yeah. is? Yeah, but you have to be a part of a sport team, and you have to earn a certain amount of points, and you have to come in first a certain amount of times to be able to earn the letter that you get to wear. I bet they don't do that anymore, do they? It's yeah, too, they do, too of discriminatory, course. isn't it? You're, you're not better than everybody else. Oh, no, no, no. You have to earn your letter. You oh, don't okay. get it. Okay. They do give it for special merits. So if you get to your senior year and you've tried your best and you just cannot get the points for your letter, they do special merits for people who have worked really hard to be able to get it as well. So my, a, my little boy... Uh, Michael Jackson berserk right for the last six months or so and in the thriller video he's got like a college uh, it's red and yellow isn't it and he's got I think it's one of those and he's got like a I forget the probably a, C, a T I, think, or, I can't or, remember yeah yeah but they they try and cut old hoodies up to make this top oh, and everything you just get him a letter jacket oh the Blooming expensive, though, honestly, the Are proper they? ones for school, yeah. Yeah. And it is a bit of status, actually. So yeah. you got yours, then? You were awarded yours from I the did. diving? I did. I got my letter in diving. Excellent. Yeah, in 11th grade. That's cool. So that was really neat. I had moved to a new school in a new neighborhood again, because that was a frequent thing. Um, I moved into Redford, very strange old town for America. Um, and I moved in with my stepmom and my dad, actually, for the first time in many, many years. And I was 17. I left Gege's house at 15, 14 to go into eighth grade. Then I left Nana's house after a couple of years to move in with my actual stepmother and father. Um, I thought it was going to be just my stepmother and my sister. And that did not happen. And I was fairly disappointed. Oh, dear. So I did not want my father in the family home. So I want to ask you, and you probably, I would imagine, don't remember, but did you, as you went through those various stages, did you ever have moments where you wondered about yourself and about your place and about your position and about who was around you and what any of it meant? And is it, did you recognise in friends, you know, often when we go to our peers, our young friends' houses when we're kids and we sort of see a different family operating in a different way, we kind of think, or I certainly did anyway, I think, fucking hell, oh, wow, this is really different because what we know is all we know, isn't it? Like the, the upbringing you know, the normal you know is, is, is kind of your barometer. So were you ever aware on, when you were going through these stages and living in various places and going from this person to that person that 
that something wasn't, wasn't right. Um, yeah. I mean, they were so brutally honest with me and my sister about what was going on when dad robbed our piggy banks. We weren't stupid. We knew. I knew things at five that most children shouldn't know ever. Mm. And seen things that I should have never seen and witnessed things I should have never witnessed. Right. Um, like eight year olds watching their dad try and fly off the roof on PCP is not cool. Jesus, no. It's just not. And it was traumatic, but I didn't feel the full impact of that until I had my first child. Wow. And in leading up to having my first child, I studied everything I could get my hands on, nutrition particularly, nutrition for children, childhood illnesses, natural medicine, um, children's brain development, anything I could get my hands on, every parenting book going And as much about birthing as possible as well, because I didn't have those mother figures to really go through the things with me that were necessary to learn all of the stuff, to to feel confident to have my own child. And I was very insecure about that, about parenting. So my family has like such an awful track record. I kept going, what kind of parent am I going to be? This is interesting. So kind of coming back to what I'd said there about those moments of wonder when you realise maybe this is not normal and where do I belong and so on. Knowing what I know about you, and we will get to that as this conversation unravels, you know, you're a go-getter and you you learn and you're you're like an autodidact in the sense you're teaching yourself all the time and achieving things and setting goals and this positive kind of assertion that you carry. Are you When, when do you realise that you've got an, a, a, a will and a want to succeed in things? And is it things like the diving? You know, how, when do you realise that you want to change the track and you don't want to repeat the pattern and that you realise there is a bad pattern in the family? Oh, far younger, far, far younger, actually. When I first started testing boundaries, probably at five or six, actually. Um, so I did very strange things that other children probably don't do, like pick up fag butts and try and smoke them Mm -hmm. at six, seven years old. I started smoking cigarettes at nine years old. What, as like a full-time gig? No, it's like I'd nick as many of the fag butts or or cigarettes out the pack as I could and take them to the playground. And this is the early 90s, 92, 93. Mm -hmm. So no one really cares. And we used to sneak out at lunchtime off the playground and run away. You would never let your kids do that today, but mm, mm. it was different then. And it was in, you know, a town, that, a bad neighborhood as well. So people paid less attention to what was going on with the kids. Of course. They had bigger issues to worry about in that neighborhood. Mm. So we got away with far too much with no supervision as very young children. But I did have to learn to teach myself as well, which helped me as an adult learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. No one was there teaching me. It wasn't a structured lesson. It was, okay, we got to figure this out. We're on our own. And that means that you have the ability to think outside the box and actually put the effort in. You can't just Google it. Mm -hmm. You have Mm -hmm. to figure it out genuinely. So I I spent a lot of time just playing and knocking about and building stuff. My dad was a builder when he was sober. So the hammer came out. The drills came out. Mm -hmm. And my dad is insane, too. Like, really insane. Did so much cool, crazy stuff with me and my sister when we were kids. Really? Oh, absolutely. One time he tied a rope to the tallest tree. I mean, this is a 100-foot tree. And and he got this rope, and he got put a board on the end of it. And we were jumping off the roof of the house and swinging clear across the neighbor's yard and up and, and back. Or... Filling my uncle's massive monster truck bed with, what do you call it, tarpaulin. Yeah, yeah. And making us a swimming pool. Wow. In the front yard. So your dad had moments of being an engaged, sort of playful father as well. Oh my God, yes, absolutely. And that was actually worse by far. Mm. So he would be using, and then it would get cold in Detroit and snowy, and he would come home and be clean through the winter. And try really bloody hard to stay clean. Yeah. And that would last anywhere from six months to two years. And then he'd be out on the streets again for summer. Mm. I'm messing about and bringing all God knows who over to the house and causing Mm. chaos and getting, he got shot. I found out he got shot one time. He told me he fell off his motorcycle. The high school football team told me he got shot. Wow. 
so having those moments with your dad where he I'm just trying to sort of put it in picture is his trauma what he whatever he's been through has just taken him off track because it feels like when he's with his children and he's in that that more healthy aligned place it, that, that's where he is that's he's who attentive I am. he's engaged he one time went and took my uncle brian and they went and stole all of the snow from the zamboni from the ice arena up the road and put it on our front lawn for christmas and built us a snowman i kid you not we were the only kids we must have been i got my dog that year so i must have been four and i got a dog called root beer wow and I got a snowman. A snowman. A snowman. Stole the snow. He I like stole that. the That's snow. That's like an album title. That is. <laughs> right out there. I didn't stole the snow. I mean, last time I went home to visit, it'll be two years, um, Easter, he took the tractor and he lives in a posh neighborhood. Do you know these posh neighborhoods where you have to like ask everybody else if you can paint your garage? Okay, yeah, yeah. One of these. And and he's got his tractor and he's driving down the street in his overalls with my kids in a little red wagon in the back of the tractor, like driving down the high street and like through the drainage tunnels with my children. I'm like, how is he now then? Shana? Sober for 15 years, works for the church, attentive, loving grandfather, looks after my grandmother who's now 80. So he managed to pull himself around. Yeah, my wedding day, he walked me down the aisle. And I remember he got hepatitis C in 1987 when he had a horrific accident and got a blood transfusion. So he had hepatitis C his whole life, nearly. They didn't find it until he was much older. It destroyed his liver. Drinking destroyed his liver. Drugs destroyed his liver. Mm. He had to go on chemo. He almost died. That was it. Never. He couldn't have chemo. There's rules. You can't have yeah. it if you're still drinking. Yeah. So he quit drinking, quit drugging, and he's been living with Nana ever since. And he's got a missus and they planted a garden. Oh, well done. So go, Dad. Yay! Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And it must be lovely for you when you see him with your kids. It is, except for I have to watch him so closely. Because <laughs> Casey does something crazy. Like strap my niece to a four-wheeler and ride 40 miles through the wilderness. <laughs> she strapped her car seat to the four-wheeler and then stuck a helmet on this baby <laughs> and like just took off. And I'm like, Dad, no, please come back. So yeah, it's great now. I live a really beautiful life so far from what I came from. Mm -hmm. I live in rural Lincolnshire. I'm raising my two kids. They go to a beautiful school with a great ethos. My mm -hmm. husband's in the military. Everything's very peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And sometimes I find myself waiting for the shoe to drop. Like, yep. what's, what's next around the corner? What's the next hurdle? Mm -hmm. Because I had that whole life, that whole life of trauma. And then I left. And I was a grown-up. And I thought that when I got to make my own choices, I was so delusional. I thought that life would magically be better. Yeah. And that is just not true. Oh, but I think, you know, to be fair to yourself, that's a, I think we all think that once we, firstly, I think we all think when we become an adult, we're going to work it out because all the adults know what's going on and then at least I'll know what's going on. Then you kind of arrive there and you realize nobody fucking knows what's going on. Nobody's got a clue. Yeah, and that idea that you're just going to make decisions that are going to be great decisions, it's all going to work out. It's just, it just doesn't work like that, does it? You, you're carrying the weight and the, the, the ripple effects and the, the, the resonating energy is just in your cells of your being and it drags you in, doesn't it? It's difficult to shake. I think it was more like no one was controlling me anymore. Like, I wasn't being controlled by circumstances. I wasn't being controlled by poverty anymore. I wasn't being controlled by parents anymore or grandparents or all these authority figures. I thought that if I got to make my own choices, that I was clever enough to make wise choices, and as a result of that, bad things wouldn't happen. Mm. But that's just not how the world works. When it came to having my first baby, I had a loss before I had a baby. Then I had her, and it was a horrific birth that caused me PTSD. I then lost two more, and then I had an early baby. Mm. He was a two-pound-14 baby. Right. And 
Let's, 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 that was a lot. Let's, we're going to get to that because that's how we met because my wife's a doula and um, anyway, we'll come to that. So you're in, you're now coming of age in America. You graduate. Yeah. How, and I, how, are, how are you 18? How old are you when you graduate? 18? 18, yeah. So how? Well, I wasn't 18 yet. I don't think I was 17 and I turned 18 in the November. And did you have a plan? Did you know what you wanted to do? Did you know that you wanted to leave the country or did you want to go into this sector or this career? Did you have an idea? And how yeah, were you meant to? Yeah, I had an absolute plan. So Gage taught me how to sew. And then from the time I was like 16 to 18, I spent all this time freaking out about what I was going to wear, like a typical teenage girl. Yep. I made a lot of the stuff myself. Um, and then. Found out there were these programs for fashion design. Uh, got my grades together really quickly. I ended up with a 4.0 straight-A student out of high school and got really? accepted into the International Academy of Design and Technology. And I went straight to fashion design, uni. Where was that? Where was that? In Detroit. Well, north of Detroit. I can't remember what city it's in, actually. That's right. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Troy. And Sorry. so it was about an hour and a half drive north of where well, home, you, yeah. where I considered home base. Yeah. Um, and we were living in Redford with both my parents, but that was going to crap, like absolutely going to crap. Like, oh, that's where we were. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were in Redford. As, you never expected your dad school. to be there. Um, he was there destroying the place, destroying our lives. Um, things were getting worse and worse. And uh, I could see the pattern. I'd watched that pattern so many times over the years. First, he starts getting lazier. Then he starts coming home later because he's stopping at the bar. Then he starts hiding in the garage. The pattern, I love what you've just said there, because that's something that with retrospect in my life, is something I think looking back I've been able to do is recognize the pattern. Oh, it's so simple. He starts getting miserable at work because he doesn't like what he's doing and he's not in control of it. So then he starts getting miserable at home and then because his relationships are strained, you know, and it's not just him. It's every every addict. Once your community breakdown, personal relationship breakdown, mm -hmm. then you're in the hole again. Community and personal relationships definitely create the space that people need to thrive. Yeah. rather than be an addict. Mm. So I watched these patterns. I knew it was happening. And then he started letting people live with us, really dodgy people that were parking behind my car. And I was having to drive a very long way to work every day mm. um, and to school. So I was working two jobs at two different restaurants at night, part-time each, and then going to full-time uni. And I was having to like get these girls up that would come home in the night and they were high, drunk, God knows what. And I'm having to drag them out the house, like, move your car. Where are your keys? I got to go it's to school. It's amazing that, that you've managed to pull off the grades. You had this mindset to be driven in this way, surrounded by just chaos and an absorbing energy that amazes me that you could muster that. But then again, I, at the same time, I could imagine that that could be your beacon of light, that, that you're just on your path and I've got to keep going towards my thing. That's exactly what it is. It is, I am so, I see the end goal, I see what I want, and I will just push the hurdle stone on the way to get there. Mm. That is it. Mm. And I got tired of it, so I moved out. I moved into my car. Oh, wow. I moved into my car like a I genius. I think that's an American thing, right? Because I don't know anybody. <laughs> Aiden, do you know anybody who's lived in a car in England? Oh, there you go. That's it's not like a thing here, um, yeah, but it not, definitely is, it? is a thing back home. Um, and I yeah. didn't really have a choice. I did stay with a really good friend of mine yep. for a little while, but that didn't work out. Um, I might be picky, but uh, like cleanliness was an issue. Okay. She well, was a beautiful person, but I had to go. That's interesting. But I stayed with another friend, yep. um, but I worked nights at a bar, so I was getting home at 2 a.m., and her parents like had this beautiful, adorable puppy, but he barked every time I walked through the door, like a lot. And then I felt really bad because I'd wake her parents up every night, and then I just decided to live in their driveway for a little while in my car. And then I decided I was going to park at the library, and it was next door to the police station. So I thought I wouldn't get robbed or yeah, killed. Yeah. Smart move. And how long <laughs> so, would that have gone on for then? Living in the car? It was winter in Detroit and we had three feet of snow and I was really cold one time. Um, and then I tried to get a roommate. I thought I had a few bad roommates, a few crazy houses that I 
Mm-hmm. So for hops for a long time. What were you like with your discipline then for social kind of reckoning? Were you partying oh, as well? Hellion. <laughs> of course I was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had no rules, so I could do whatever I wanted. I started. I didn't drink a lot. That was one thing that really frightened me as a young person. So I didn't start drinking. I dr- I dabbled a little bit with one set of friends when I was on the diving team at a few parties for mm-hmm. sports and things. Um, sorely regretted it because having a hangover in a hot pool is gross. Yeah. The next day, it was a terrible mistake. Um, but I didn't really drink. I was a stoner yep. through high school. Yeah. Um, and actually being a stoner, I got really great grades mm. as soon as I became a stoner. Before that, I could not get the grades. I could not focus. I could not settle down. Yes enough Mm. to get the good grades and be interested in the topic as Mm. well so that helped me dramatically that's interesting um and then i quit smoking weed when i got the job on the cruise ship i just makes sense yeah yeah i kind of grew up i kind of just it was time to get a job all the jobs test and it was like okay i'm done with this now high school's over Mm -hmm. let's go be a grown-up yeah yeah in the real world and uh, i was living in my car Hated working at the restaurants. Hated hated going to school. My boyfriend broke up with me. Yeah. Hang on a minute. You, you, so you're doing this stuff. You're working two jobs. You're going to school. You're working hard to get the grades. But you're not enjoying it in any no. way. But do you know... I did. I enjoyed the actual fashion. I enjoyed actually sewing. So yeah. I have a gift for it. It comes naturally. I can pretty much pick up a piece of fabric and cut it up into an outfit and put it together. And because it came naturally, I thought it's what I should be doing. Yes, makes sense. But it's boring. Right. It was so boring, cutting um, and the tiniest little stitches, and I'd get really, really, really frustrated because the whole machine would get tangled up, and you just wanted to throw it out the window. Mm -hmm. It's a skill that takes a lot of muscle memory. Yep. And you have to be very calm, and you have to practice it all the time. And I was very young, and that just it wasn't compatible in my life. Mm-hmm. But more so, my personal life was too turbulent to really be able to focus. I was homeless. That's like number one priority is a roof over your head. And if you don't have that, how on earth are you supposed to be successful at work or enjoy it yep. when you're worried about going home at night? Yep. Or how are you supposed to be successful in academics? I mean, I was worried about my little sister who was still in our god-awful house with my parents. I was worried about my parents. How much younger than you is your sister? Two years. Okay, so... And I grew up with her from the day she was born until forever. She's my sister through and through. Big shout out to your sister if she sees this. She will, actually. Ashley Boone. She's so cute. Hey, Ashley. How are you good? Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I just got this idea and my friend was a flight attendant and I was like, Hey, let's go somewhere. Like we need to go somewhere. So she's like, where do you want to go? And I'm like, let's go to Florida. <laughs> like spring break. It's not even spring break, but we're going somewhere. <laughs> um, cause she put me down as her spouse or whatever. Cause she didn't have a spouse. She was too young. So we got to fly cheap. Um, and we looked up the weather and the entire East coast is covered in hurricanes. It's Far too far to fly to the west coast of America in three days and back. So we're like, nope, that's out of the question. Rhode Island is the only place on the map that doesn't have a hurricane and has a beach that we can swim in. Mm -hmm. So we flew to Rhode Island for one day just to see the ocean. Oh, wow. Me and my best friend. In the waiting room at the airport, this guy is flirting with me, Paul. And he's adorable. And he swears he's the captain of a cruise ship. And I'm like, okay, yeah, love. Sure you are. I love your little English bits you're dropping in there every now and again. <laughs> your little nuances. Yeah. Um, so he gives me his number. I don't think much of it. I just got dumped after like two and a half years of being with this lad So in let's high just school. stop there for a minute then. So you, you relationships coming from the background you've come from, the, the surrounding relationships that you've come from. Obviously, lots of people would be deterred from even entering relationships or other people would have the pattern repeat and relationship after relationship and be volatile and boisterous. How did you approach a relationship? Were you sensitive to it? Were you, you know, were you um, worried? Were you extrovert? Were you introvert? How did, it, how did it go for you in that way? I am like always been really interested in having a boyfriend. 
even from when I was very young, um, my love language is touching. Definitely. So mm. I like to hug. I like raves. I like mosh pits. I was in a mosh pit pregnant with Sienna <laughs> for Blink-182 and Nottingham. Right. Like, I want to jump off a stage one day and have everyone catch me. Yeah. Like, the section. more people touching me, the better, actually. Okay. Especially, like, Christmas market when you're being herded like a sheep yes. through to look at all the fancy cheese. Yes. And the, and I love the excitement of a crowd. For people watching, can we, and the people probably can't remember, can you remember when we used to touch and, like, be together and, like, that? I mean, you would, and then when I'm in a crowd like that, I'm, like, making best friends with the guy next to me and the guy next to me. I'm like, oh, did you try that cheese? Yeah. And then my husband's like, I don't know her. <laughs> Please, I don't know her. Like, she's not with me. <laughs> like, Steve! Steve, I'm here! And he's like, no, love, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, relationship-wise, I would always just jump straight in full. I am so transparent, and I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I got hurt a lot. And sometimes I hurt other people, too. So how old have you been when you had your first kind of what you would call, like, a, a serious relationship? The first boyfriend, the first real boyfriend. Um... That'd be Ricky. And yeah. I actually have his initials tattooed on me still to this day. Yeah, I've got my first. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I got yeah. I've got an R and a K for Ricky Crop. Um, and I love that boy something else. Yeah. And I loved his whole family. Mm -hmm. And that for me was way more important. Yeah. So wow oh God, how old was I when I got with him? Sixteen? Okay, so you were about the right age, I would say, in terms of general emotional ability to be able to do that oh stuff. i had lots of boyfriends before that but they were mostly we yeah. skated around the neighborhood holding hands exactly, and jump yeah. roping together tick box, and yes or ticks, no. <laughs> tick box and yeah. some snogging in the hedges with yeah. the roller blades yeah. on etc but yeah i was kind of nervous about anything further than that anything yeah. more serious than mm. that mm -hmm. um and then yeah, I met this kid, and, and we were together for ages um, until I graduated. Wow. But what, he was a year behind me at school. And, of course, I graduated, and I had these really tough life circumstances that he did not. His family was beautiful. I mean, they're like any other family. They have their own issues. They have their own things that yeah. go on. Yeah. But it wasn't the kind of abuse and detrimental situation like I was in. And I had to leave home, and he could not grasp that concept. Right. And he he couldn't trust me out in the big world at uni and, and off by myself. And mm -hmm. what could I possibly be doing? And who am I at dinner with? And why are you at dinner with guys? And mm. like, I'm at uni. I have to go live now. Mm. Um, mm. And it didn't work out in the end. And my heart was so broken. Mm. Oh, my heart was so broken. Have you spoken to him? Have you ever spoken to him since? Have you ever kept in touch or anything? Or see on Facebook or <laughs> all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. And actually, I took his mother some glass from Holy Island in Scotland. All right. Um, cause she always collected sea glass and they have a ton of it out there. So I sent her a little letter and oh, that's lovely of to you. his mother. Well, a thing to remember Not, and do. Um, his family was my family. So his family taught me an immense amount of the things that I know now. So I was the only girl that went to hunting camp. Right. I got my hunter safety license at 15, 16. And then me and his cousin Chaz did the class together. I was on the diving team with his other two cousins that I didn't know about that till I turned up to a family reunion. And I was like, what are you two doing here? And they're like, what are you doing here? And ah, of course. I was like, well, I'm with my boyfriend and you're dating my cousin. Uh -huh. And then uh, we had this huge network of friends in this neighborhood and, and all these little other neighborhoods. that We all went to high school together. We all knew each other. Um, and we did a lot of like hunter gathering. We tried to set traps in the woods and... And learned to shoot. That was the big thing. I learned to shoot. And I went hunting for the first time. And uh, um, that was important. I learned how to shoot a bow. I love shooting a bow. We learned that just earlier this year, didn't we? A long bow. Yeah. A long bow, yes. There's quite a lot to it, isn't there? Oh, yeah. I like to shoot a recurve, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is better for me. And I can't really shoot a compound. Well, I might be able to now. I'm a lot stronger now than when I was 18. Yeah. Um, so when I was 17, 18, I was very, very slim build and on, a, on <laughs> well not anymore but i was very very slim then 99 okay. pounds I really weighed. yeah yeah and i'd try i would get so close to getting it to lock and then i would just not be be able to get it to lock and, <laughs> and i fought with that damn bow for years mm -hmm. and i i don't know if i could get it to lock now or not my shoulder strength has definitely improved mm -hmm. 
Um, but yeah, so I, I did a lot of planting, growing, hunting, natural things, um, all growing up. When my dad was sober, he would take us up north on the weekend. That's what people in Michigan do. Everyone in Michigan goes up north at the weekend. And it means they go to their cabin or their boat or their lake. We have the most lakes of anywhere in the world. It's beautiful. Mm. So we spend all this time out in nature in America. And that was kind of like a saving grace. That's where I would yeah. do all my thinking and I would be free. Mm. So that was really great. So his family then impacted you in in ways that I guess you would have continued to learn or pick up on far into the future when, you know, their stability and their, their, their family kind of togetherness. Oh, absolutely. I still go visit them. Yeah. I still go visit my two, the two cousins, the two girls, Tiffany and Amber. They live way up north now in this beautiful place, the cherry capital of the world, Traverse City. Right. Um, and I still go visit them all the time uh, whenever I get the chance. Mm. And it's amazing. I'm still connected to his whole family because all of those cousins he has a huge family as well their family is just massive i thought i want to say 15 mm. um his mom has 15 brothers and sisters 14 oh. mm. something like that grandma hamlin grandma hamlin's the most beautiful lady a beautiful little old granny that she just took me in like one yeah. of her own onto her farm that's where everybody goes to visit um and i was just one of the family and we would you know, bonfire and stuff. Um, and when that relationship ended, it was tragic for me. I just was... What about Ricky? Was he upset? I don't really know. I did, he's the one who broke up with me. Mm. But he wanted me to wait for him. Of course, because you're a year in front and you're off into the world and there's that weird kind of... It was, yeah, it was hard. It was hard for both of us. Uh, he begged me to stay. I got a job on a cruise ship. I decided after six months of moping about and pining after him and crying most mm. of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Super, why? <laughs> um, I was like, this is it, dude. If, if we're not getting back together and it's not forever, then I'm buggering off on the cruise ship and that's it. And that's that. And mm -hmm. he did not believe me that I was going. He thought I was lying until the day I left. Mm -hmm. And I listened to that Daft song, leaving on a jet plane. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and I left and I got on a plane and I flew to Duluth, Minnesota. And I got on the cruise ship with one suitcase. And you knew that that was a year. It was for, it was indefinite. I had a contract as long as I wanted it. I had, uh, you do your initial three month contract and then you get a raise and you get more training, bloody blah, blah, blah. If you do well, you get moved up. Yep. And then you have to compete to get selected for the Caribbean season. So they only pick the top stewardesses to go. Okay. Because it's a hot, long, hard season. And once you're down there, you're down there. Right. That's it. No They're not going to send you home. Yeah. Because it's a long crossing. It's a five-day crossing. You're five days from land when you leave Florida. Really? Yeah. Oh, that would scare me to death, I think. Through the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. And some 40-foot swells. It yeah. was amazing. I loved every minute of it. I really? loved the boat. Oh, so you, you were selected and you did that? I did, yes. So I did the first uh, first four months on the cruise ship because I was late to the season. One girl got sick and left, I think, so I replaced her. And I replaced her in Duluth, Minnesota. And if I had a map, I could show you, but I don't have a map. We right? can get one up on the, on the oh, screen yeah. there. So. I can show you where we went. If you can get a map of Michigan and Minnesota, actually the whole East Coast will work. Yeah. I can literally show you on a map where I went on the cruise ship. America is just enormous it, compared to... It really is. And the tours that I did on this ship were amazing. So we've started with the summer tours. Anyone will do. That's good. I can nearly see Duluth right there. And how far does this go? This goes pretty far too. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah. I that's see that. Duluth, Minnesota-ish. Yeah. And we took the boat through here and down and around and back up and through there like five times, I yeah. think. And then down and all the way up and around. And in Canada, that was amazing when we stopped there. So we were in Montreal and Quebec and they have a St. Catherine Street there. Nice. And it's all bars and clubs down both roads. And it's just incredible, beautiful. And then we went all the way down to Virginia here. Yep. Where our boat broke. So the boat the, broke. The boat broke. The boat broke. And it was... It the, didn't sink. It just stopped. No, it was the bow thrust day. 
Okay. Which is how you stop and go, pretty much. Like, the boat broke. Right. Um, so we had to be put in what they call a dry dock. They tow you in. Big thing comes underneath you, lifts you out the water. They so do they the work. they do the work, and then, yeah. And then they lower you back down. Mm-hmm. I'm like, are we staying on this while they pick us up? And he's like, Captain says yes. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> Captain says yes. I'm like, okay, you're the boss. Mm-hmm. I'm good. Get the work done. Everything's back to normal. They have those amazing little um, crew quarters, they call it, on land. And we're not allowed to drink on the ship at all. As ever. staff. Ever. No, you're not even allowed a bottle on there. Right. Ever. No alcohol. Um, but, of course, you get off the boat and you can drink. And you come back on pissed. Right. And everybody does. Okay. Um, so we would go and play cards and games and watch movies in the crew quarters on land and drink. And then come back to our quarters on boat and go to sleep. Well, I dreamed that the boat fell off the dock. I kid you not, I dreamed the boat fell off the dock, and all I could see is that somebody hit their face on the glass, and somebody hit their face on one of the poles in the dining room. And I told my captain this. I get up in the morning, I'm like, the boat's going to fall off the dock, the boat's going to fall off the dock. I'm throwing a fit. I'm like, I want to get off, I want to get off. You're not lowering me with me on this boat. Do not lower this boat. He's like, oh, Shannon, come on, seriously, that's enough. Like, he's, You're not taking your premonition seriously? Not at all. So he's like, nope, nope. So we're all waiting. We're getting lowered. Sure enough, we fall. Sure enough, the whole ship no grinds way. to a halt and turns and gets stuck. And my cruise director, Ryan, smashes his face against the glass. And Sherry, one of the other girls, smashes her face against the pole. Everything I saw, and I, we get off this boat. They gave us six minutes to evacuate. We get off this boat and get to the crew quarters. How many people on the boat? 20. Right. 25 at this point, because we were just getting ready. We sh- we had to send all our passengers home, refund them, everything. It was a big deal, that boat breaking in mm-hmm. Virginia. Um, And I get to the crew quarters, and I spot the captain, and he just shakes his head at me and says, don't, <laughs> and points at me to go sit down. F- I think five million pound it cost that company do you have those kinds of premonitions regularly dreaming and seeing things yeah yeah my whole life but i can't i don't know how to work it or i have no idea where it comes from and i can't do it well enough to actually benefit myself yet (laughs) so if you know how to figure that out yeah sometimes though i just i'm a very intuitive person and i live through intuition And that's how I draw the people to me that I need for what I need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That's how I push the people away from me that I don't need to interact with. Mm. People see me coming and they run the other way sometimes. It's a valuable skill, though. I'm cool with it because I know that those people are not meant to be near me. It's a filter system. Yeah, Yeah, it is. And Mm. and that's very important. I learned to listen to my instincts after many, many years of not and getting in trouble as a result of it or having conflicts or... Mm. Or finding these situations where I'm like, no, this isn't right. Something doesn't feel right. I'm not mm. happy. So the more I intuitively live, the more things come to me that I need. Mm-hmm. And it works great. No, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in that. It's something that I've learned to trust more and more. And during this pandemic time, the, the, the line, trust yourself, is something that I always, I arrive back at it all the time. In whatever context you want to break this whole epoch down in. And living your life that way and trusting. Because I think so much of that falls on how truthful you're being to yourself anyway. And listening to you so far, you know, you just, as you said, Lay transparent. Lay it on the table. <laughs> heart on the sleeve. It is what it is. No bones. Just this is it. I think that, that facilitates that ability to, the instinct to be strong and to trust it. Because you're not kidding yourself. You're not tricking yourself. And therefore, you know, everything else around you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It did take a long, long time to get to grips with this intuitive living thing. And and it's almost, um, it doesn't matter what's coming next. It doesn't matter what hurdle is coming next. There is a hurdle. Mm. So just get to it when you get to it. Mm. And living free in that way has helped me a lot. And, And doing all the different therapies, doing all the different techniques that I've been doing, learning the things I've learned have led up to me being able to do this now and Mm -hmm. and be you know kind of excited and happy and progressing all of the time moving forward all of the time Mm. it wasn't easy particularly moving to britain 
mm-hmm. and all the different moving. Every time you move and you're in these new circumstances, I get this rush of insecurity. So much, so insecure. Yeah. Particularly when I got married. I got married very, very young. So I'm off. I'm in Virginia. Yep. And then we go straight down the East Coast after the boat breaks. We get flown to Florida, mm-hmm. the whole crew, and put on our separate boat. Yep. And then we go straight from Florida over to, where'd we go first? Uh, Panama. Okay. Which is further down. You can't see Panama on that map, I think. We did Key West tours, and then we went straight to Panama. What's Panama like? Beautiful. Yeah? Strange. People? Amazing. Kind of hostile towards Americans, though, rightfully so. Yeah, I heard that. We had a a guy, did a lot of South America, English lad, Peter Fricci, lovely guy. To be fair, not that many places in the world are nice to Americans, actually. Well, what he found funny was he said initially that people thought he was American. And then when he spoke at a British accent, people were like completely different with him, really welcoming. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. That's not me, is it? It is. Sorry. No worries. Um, that's one of my agents, actually, for some of my my work. So. Yeah, well, we're going to get to that. Uh, yes. So we go over to ah uh, Honduras first. There's Panama. Yeah, yeah. And actually, Honduras, we, yeah. we went from Florida to Honduras. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest stretch of being away from land because of the direction that you have to go, like, through to get to Honduras. Yeah. Honduras is amazing. My favorite, favorite place to snorkel by far. Right. Um, and I did a lot of snorkeling tours on the cruise ship for fun, like as extra. So we you get to, you get time to do that kind of stuff. Though. Oh yeah, yeah, it's hard work, seven days a week, and you are up and working at five thirty. And what would your general sort of daily service everything. be? Everything. You're it doing was a everything. Small ship, so hundred passenger vessel, not one of these big cities. It mm. was a tiny exclusive boat. So we would get up and you start service at six. So you're up at five thirty, ready, going, setting tables. Chopping fruit, doing dishes, serving, cleaning up. And you do that for each meal. But you do it for yourself. So crew meal and passenger meal. Right. And then you do linens in your morning break after breakfast. You do your linens in your rooms. So you clean eight rooms. And I've never had to clean so fast in all my life. I kid you not. It's like a speed of race to get through these rooms. And we have all these fancy techniques and we... And, mm-hmm. and we know how to do hospital quarters, fast and firm. Yeah. Um, and then you get four hours break in between uh, breakfast and lunch. And you go out and you go four run hours. tours. That's a, that's a good, decent chunk then, isn't it? You can do something with Or no, hours. sorry. You set up, serve lunch, and then you get four hours in between right. dinner, lunch and dinner. And you get four hours off as a stewardess. So to kind go, of the afternoon you get a yeah. bit of time to actually do something. Yeah, and you That's just go cool. out. Usually you're signed up for things, though. So it's a small crew, so somebody's got to do their turn running the tours. So Mayan Ruins tours. Um, in Virginia, it was like the old Virginian houses, tours of all the Edison's house and things like this, all that sort of stuff. Fall foliage tours, the um, Statue of Liberty tours, when we went past that, obviously. Mm. Depends where you are, what you're doing, but the Mm. Caribbean particularly was my favorite. So I ran a lot of snorkeling tours. I would go out early, early in the morning, swim miles and miles, find all the cool stuff, and then go show all the passengers in the afternoon. Wow. And what kind of stuff have you seen then when you've been doing that? Everything magical in the sea. Really? Like urchins. Starfish, lionfish, sharks of all sorts. They used to catch all sorts of big fish. The most beautiful reefs you've ever seen. What's it like the first time you see a shark and you've just got a little snorkel and flippers on? I loved it. Yeah? I loved it. Mm. I just hung out there for ages watching him. Mm. Um, And there was a nurse shark underneath uh, like a a coral. Um, I went and got a bunch of people and I was like, come look at this. How much do you know about sharks and stuff like that or any kind of predatory or dangerous things in, in an exotic sea. Do you have any pre, pre-knowledge pre on that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you so I mean, of... my television was, you know, the essentially BBC mm. in America, mm. the the American broadcasting system. Mm. And um, it was great. So we had things like Reading Rainbow and Mr. Rogers and 
Sesame Street. I mm. mean, you learned so much from those programs as kids when you were a poor kid. Mm. It was fine. Mm. And then I had great mentors anyway. I was a strong swimmer from the diving team. Yeah. It all kind of fit and I just loved it. Mm. We're we're I'm if you look at Michigan again, we have the most water. Look at all that water. We grow yeah. up with those five massive lakes. And they are huge, aren't they? Lake Superior is eighteen hundred feet deep. Whoa. On Lake Michigan, I think that's almost 500 miles long. I mean, they're the size of... Yeah, like Britain. Like, yeah, like More, states, aren't bigger, they? Bigger than England, that's yeah. for sure. That's unreal, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, A my lake. British husband stood on the edge of the lake in awe on Lake Superior going, that can't be a lake. How could that not be a sea? And it's mountainous and just beautiful. It is super rural, and our cities and our t our our countryside are laid out differently to yours too. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at Michigan, okay, no, I know, isn't it gorgeous? Wow, Windigo. So some of my favorite places are like Shoepack Lake. Um, Shoepack is a no wake lake, and it's a spring fed lake, so you can see miles down in the lake. Oh, I see. So there's no petrol or oil or anything like no, that. No, so clean. I have never, I was so surprised. Why you all people put shopping trolleys in your rivers here? It's I don't a strange understand. tradition that some of us Brits have, have <laughs> got. I've, I've left a couple of shopping trolleys here and there, but never in a lake. Like, I river. keep being like, can we go swimming in the river? And everyone's like, no, that's gross. And I'm like, why? I don't like. We have beautiful water systems. We are having a water crisis now, though. I left mm. 15 years ago, and there is a huge water crisis in Flint right now. It's all over the news. You can look up the Flint water crisis, um, and it's actually an absolute disgrace. Um, the water's poisoned. The people can't use it out of their taps, and they've been having to buy water for Look at this. This is so oh bad. God. This is huge, hugely bad for... We have the most water of anywhere in the world, fresh water. And I believe it's Nestle owns the rights to it. Nestle, the chocolate factory. And they people. stick it in one of these. Oh, they do, the bastards. We, I don't want to drink that now. Yeah, please don't. I don't buy bottled water. No. I'm an eco warrior. Nestle. I think it does Nestle have the rights. I want to say it is. I think, I think you're you need to check, though, to make sure I'm not spouting, like, flagging off the wrong company. <laughs> That'd be really bad. But that's what I heard. Wow. So beautiful there. So you're on the cruise. Yep. You've made it into, like, the elite team. You've got you've carved out this wonderful way of having your own time and you're, you're snorkeling and you're taking teams out. And, and I look great doing it, too, because you, I'm 20 and I'm snorkeling 10 miles a day and I got money because I'm earning well. a good wedge, money for the first time in my life, and I'm shopping. Mm -hmm. And did you have any near misses? You know, when you take a team out snorkeling, stuff like that, do you ever, like, lose anyone or ever anything kind of like, oh, oh shit? Oh, we had so many different little things with passengers. I mean, all the time. And and it was such a soap opera. And the whole ship is who's sleeping with who. And, oh, yes. And, close and it's quarters. the close quarters. And, and it's kind of crazy. And one time a passenger caught me sneaking back in, like, a tank top and a mini skirt with no shoes on. And I'm half cut. And I'm sneaking down into my quarters. And... Mm. Uh, one time me and the girls had a really close call in Quebec, a storm came through and we were out drinking at the nightclubs and they took the gangway in because when it's storming, the gangway yeah, of course, yeah. bangs all over the place on the dock and we couldn't get back on the boat and they were going to leave without us and we could see them getting ready and we're like, shit, we were supposed to be home two hours ago and we're in high heels and mini skirts and... We go to the back of the boat, and there's like um, on the on the back, there's this um, bar, and and we see this spot, and we're like, right, we're gonna jump, and this boat is coming up and going out and coming up and going out, and You're we gonna have to catch it. And we gotta time it just right, and you gotta jump, grab the bar, and swing onto the deck. Is the plan in Quebec, and it's pitch black, and it's gray, and it's chucking rain everywhere. We all managed it. I don't know how we survived. You did that. it? You oh did yeah, it. we did it. Oh, good yeah. on you. We all did it. Awesome. But, but that was stupid. Seriously mm. stupid. Mm. Um, and after Quebec, we got to Boston. Boston was one of the worst days of my life, actually. Okay. 
I'm so sad about this, but it's so bizarre. I met Muhammad Ali in Detroit. Right. And I dropped my cell phone in Boston with the one picture I had of me and Muhammad Ali. How did that meeting come around? He got tickets to the playoff game of the Pistons basketball. In 2005, we were in the playoffs. And he got a private box and he ate at my restaurant before he went to his okay, private box. cool, cool. And it was amazing. He even picked up a customer's baby and kissed him on the face. Like right in front of everyone. Pictures, everybody went crazy. It was, it was amazing. Yeah, I bet. But Boston, I was going up the gangway at night and my handbag literally just dropped off my shoulder straight into the water. And I was there getting ready to dive after it. And the deckhands are like, no, that's 10 degrees and freezing and yeah, yeah. 40 feet deep. And you're never getting that back. And I'm like, no. That's gone. Mm. Gone. My, um, I carry a lot of trinkets about. So I always have these trinkets from people or places I go. So I had two silver dollars for my great grandmother in my wallet there too. And a feather. And I was just like, oh, oh. And Got now it. I gotta get new trinkets, you know. Mm. But that one picture, that was pre cell phone being able to message yourself a picture. Like, you, I, so you couldn't just, send it yeah, anywhere. It was just on that phone. That's and it, it wasn't a great photo. I don't think anybody would have believed me anyway, because mm. it was so like, <laughs> quick, turn the phone around. An old Nokia, yeah, actually. Yeah. Like the very first Nokia is turn the phone around. The first one's with the camera. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was fairly disappointed in Boston mm. when that happened. Mm. Um, and then I found out that my sister wasn't doing very well at home while I was in the Caribbean. Due to the circumstances with mum and dad? Well, she moved out. She moved in with a boyfriend. Okay. Um, and I kept telling her, go to school, get a job, pay for your cell phone, I'll pay for your apartment. Just get the heck out of there. Just don't live with a boyfriend. Don't live with anybody else. Don't. I'm like, I can afford it. I don't need my money for anything anyway. I eat cruise ship food. Like, it's no big deal, but she would not accept help and she would not leave her boyfriend. It was what she felt was the safest place for her. Mm -hmm. um, and he turned out to be an absolute psycho. Absolute psycho. Went to prison. Mm. Stabbed someone in a gas station and went to prison. And so I felt really, like, torn. I had enough of the cruise ship because it's very brutal hard work. So yeah. you're working seven days Close a week. Quarters, I was well over a course of time. Six girls in one room. Um, mm. Relationships are messy. And I had met someone. I had met Stephen, my now husband. This is where I wanted to get to. Yeah. Is, yeah, I met him in Belize. So we did tours in Panama, Honduras, Guatemala. Um, and we basically went those three places over and over and over again. And Belize. Belize, Guatemala, Panama, Panama, Belize, Guatemala. So how old are you when you meet Stephen in Belize then? 20. So you're tw just 20? I just turned just 20. 20. And you meet Stephen, and what's different when you meet Stephen? Well, I knew that we were at kind of a strange dock in Belize because we were at the city dock that is kind of out the way. Um, and it's not near all the big cruise liners and stuff because we go to really private places because we're on that tiny little ship. Um, so we're on a totally separate dock. And then I'm out in town and me and the girls saw all these really hot guys. And we're like, where the heck did these really hot white boys come from? Because they are not from our boat. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out the British military trained there. Okay. So there are 40 British military lads having dinner at a place called Pup Pup Bar that we like to go to. Um, and I didn't know Steve was there, but I saw all the lads and I was like, hey, girls, we're going out tonight. We're going to go poll tonight. Like, look, mm. there's people out. Um, and we went to the, all these bars and me and my friend Kate went to the casino. And that's actually the first time I saw my husband. He walked past me. While Kate and I were getting our biometrics run at this at the front office, they were doing all our photos and everything. Um, and it's one of those when you're gonna look, you're gonna look to see if he's looking back, and if he's looking back, you know there's something yeah. about to happen. And he was so handsome. My husband is so good looking. That stinker. He still is. He aged better than me too. Powerful Stephen. Oh God, he's just. That's nice to hear he's you. He's so say gorgeous that. and lovely that. It's sickening, actually, sometimes. He's that nice. He's that person yeah, that but everyone loves. 15 years in, that's, that's ace that you that you think that and you believe that and he is that. That's lovely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, 
Looks aren't everything, though. Let's no, keep no, that in mind. No, no, but you just said he's lovely. <laughs> you know, you said he he's is, lovely. He is. He's a well. good man. I mean, it has. Yeah, it's been 15 years. But I, I did the look back with him, and he did look back. And we uh, we didn't say anything then. And then um, I was in a wet T-shirt contest that night with Kate. But she got absolutely wrecked and had to be carried home by the captain <laughs> of the cruise ship. And he was, he was like, kind of mad, but he had contributed to our delinquency. Right. So he knew we were doing the contest and stuff, but it had gotten way too late. So wet t-shirt contests in Belize don't start until, like, 5 in the morning, by mm-hmm. the way, which is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had stayed, and I stayed... I hid behind the bar because you're not allowed to stay out alone. So I'm a tiny little blonde girl in Belize. And my captain's like, you're going home. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Bye. Take off ladies room. Hide behind the bar. Try not to get caught so I can stay out all night. Stay out all night with the Brits. Um, And Stephen and I got a hotel room. And Mm. we had breakfast in the morning. and, Mm. And you're not allowed to stay off the ship. So... We had this person called Mama Ruth. That's what we call her. She's a local lady from Belize that worked on board with us. And she looked after all the girls in our quarters. Um, and Mama Ruth and our guards and our <laughs> and Andrew show up at my breakfast table with Stephen. And Stephen has a gun pointed at him from one of our guards. And Mama Ruth is there shouting at me, girl, where have you been? We thought you got stolen. You know you're not supposed to stay off this ship. We thought somebody could have taken you and you'd be gone. And mm. and she's having to go at me. And I'm like, please go away. Do you see I'm on a date <laughs> with the <laughs> most beautiful person I've ever seen before? Mm-hmm. Like, you are ruining it. I don't have to be to work till 11. Bye, Mama Ruth. I'm a grown-up lady. And did that work? Did that yeah, they le- they did leave. But that, because I didn't tell anyone where I was, and all I did was hide and stay out all night, they were freaking out. Totally mm. irresponsible teenager move. Mm-hmm. Um. But in the end, and then I started asking the captain, I'm like, can he come for dinner with us? He's like, well, I'm feeding all the Belizean people. I may as well. So he started coming to dinner with us on the boat. And we'd sit on the dock and exchange music on our iPads. And uh, and that was fun. And we'd go on dates. So I would go out run my tours during the week and then come back and disembark the passengers and spend the weekends with the Brits. Wow. And our ship boys did not like it at all. Right. So all these cute military Brits nicked all the cruise ship girls. Right. All the girls went crazy. Oh, listen to their accents. Oh, my God, aren't they mm. so wonderful? And, and they sang rugby songs in the bar. Mm. Those girls had never seen anything like rugby songs yeah. in the bar. Yeah. And they were just swooning. Of course, they were swooning with the lads. And, and um, would most of the girls, all American girls like you? Oh, they were all American girls like yeah. me. Yeah, young, mm. young American girls, except for... Sherry was older than us. She had grandkids and she was kind of, she'd worked there for a very long time. It was mm. like her life's work. Mm. That's what she did. Um, and yeah, so we partied like rock stars and then I quit. Mm-hmm. I just, I had enough. I quit. I wanted to go check on my sister. And that's when I backpacked from LA to New Orleans to Detroit with Steven. With Steven. So you two, you two guys of that kind of a, a blossom in romance, if you like. Yeah, then. for about two months, almost. About six or seven weeks in Belize, mm-hmm. we were dating. Mm-hmm. And I kind of said, you know, this is a summer romance. You do realize that, right? And you're in the military and I'm not interested. Um, and he's like, well, take me to America with you. I'm like, what? Okay, sure. Why the heck not? Um, and so I flew into L.A., I learned a really harsh life lesson okay. on packing light. <laughs> I don't think, not many women have, have, have fathomed that one, have they? Packing oh, light. God, I packed everything, including the kitchen sink out of that cruise ship in this backpack. I'm going to go backpacking, right? So I bought a backpacker's backpack for the first time. Then I had to sit on the floor and like throw <laughs> myself up. And then I couldn't stand up. And then I must have walked 20 miles the first day, had nowhere to sleep, slept in a hedge <laughs> on a beach in L.A. <laughs> and uh, and I just, my calves were like stone the next day. They had you been to hurt. L.A. before? Was this no. first time for you? Yeah. Okay. I flew into L.A. on a whim. It was as far away from home as possible. Mm. And I was kind of reluctant to go home straight away. Yeah. 
And I had some money. Um, so I just flew to L.A. on a whim. Like, and then I ended up, they, they tried to not let me stay in any youth hostels because I was American. And I'm like, yeah, but I live 3,000 miles away. Like, I'm not going to stay in L.A. forever. But they do have a lot of people come, mm. stay forever. I'm like, uh, no, look, here's my ticket to leave. Like, I'm going. So we used youth hostels all the way across. And Greyhound buses. Mm. And we met some really cool people that we're still in touch with today. Awesome. Actually, from the bus. Yeah. And uh, and some of the lads, we were drinking moonshine on the bus, traveling all through the country. And How long were you, you and Stephen traveling across America backpacking then? How long did it take us? About three, four weeks, I think, to mm -hmm. get back to Detroit. And I had like two, by the end of it, I packed up all my crap, first of all, and sent it home. Because I was like, I'm not walking around with all this stuff. Mm. Like, this is ridiculous. That's quite an um, humbling lesson when you work out how to use a backpack properly. Yeah, I was like, oh, have I got a duvet? <laughs> like, I have a sleeping bag and a duvet. I'm not going to be that cold. It's it's spring, love. Like, let's get real. Well, do I need that many books? They're really heavy. Really heavy books. Darn it. Um... Yeah, and I hurt myself. I genuinely hurt myself. I couldn't walk for a whole day. Like, mm. my calves were yeah. so tight from mm. how far and how long. And I was very fit at that time, too. Mm -hmm. But it was a different type of strain yeah, that yeah. I had done. It is, yeah. Um, and Stephen thought it was hilarious. And then I'm out doing all this exercise and doing all this hiking before he flies in. And I pack peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Of course. You know, and uh, and my husband keeps saying, well, my boyfriend at the time, Steve, the, he's like, I need to get some proper food. I need to get some proper food. I'm like, I packed you peanut butter and jelly. What is not proper about that? And I like had no idea that, first of all, you two, you guys don't mix that flavor combination. No, that's ever. a classic American <laughs> yeah. soundbite, that is. <laughs> and then like, he meant like meat, like chicken and pasta. Mm. He was on a diet that was like chicken and pasta and peas mm. and like quite a lot of it as well yeah. because he was working out quite a lot yeah um so he was just like this this pb and j stuff is not cutting it while we're backpacking kid we need real food please <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like it took me actually quite a lot of years to realize after i moved to britain why peanut butter and jelly was not considered real food. Mm -hmm. Like, and then I had that revelation many years later after we were married. I was like, oh, that's why you didn't want the peanut butter and jelly when we were hiking. Now I get it. It smelled <laughs> like a British thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we take him to meet grandma. By the time we get there, we're scruffy. We've not had haircuts. We've not, my bra strap broke. It's tied together. This hole's in our jeans. And grandma comes rushing out of the house, Nana, and she's not seen me in a year. And she rushes straight past me to my husband. Oh, thank goodness you guys are here. And when I called her to tell her I was bringing this man home, the, her first response was, the hell you are. Right. You're not bringing a man home. But Nana, you don't understand. He's British and he's gorgeous and you're going to love him. And I have to bring him home with me right now. And it's much safer to backpack with someone else. Yes. And I played every... Well, you know you're sleeping in separate bedrooms when you get to my house. That's mm -hmm. Nana's rules. And mm -hmm. I was like, fine, Nana, it's fine. I, You know, we'll roll with it. So we turn up, she falls madly in love with him because he rakes the leaves in the garden for her with mm -hmm. my little three-year-old cousin and cleans the gutters and that's it. Like, Grandma's forever in love with Stephen. Top man. And even now to this day, if I call Simone about him, she's like, oh, that man's so good to you. You ought to stop moaning. Uh, Grandma totally swaps sides, man. And, that's and lovely, though, because, again, like, sort of without rewinding back to, you know, the more much more traumatic part of your life you know to have that union between your nana and your, your new fella and people get on and respect and that's a lovely thing oh yeah they adore from. him and and when he goes out there he calls himself a hillbilly in training right and Love just it. and does stuff like set off fireworks with my dad in a hoodie like ducking down behind the boats and like my dad's like ran out of gas in the boat before and and they flag people down, come on, save us, and mm -hmm. go dirt biking with my, you know. And so he really fit into the family. He he really got a lot of shock to the system because Stephen comes from a military background. His whole family is military and police. Mm -hmm. And they're all goody two-shoes, really. And they're all, like, these upstanding citizens. I mean, his granddad has an MBE. Wow. So awesome. So to come from this, like, 
beautiful, well-rounded family to then see my crackhead down in his overalls, like skin and bones, was such a revelation for him as well. And I was so insecure about letting this beautiful man into that picture. Yep. I hid a lot from him at the beginning mm -hmm. because I was terrified he was going to run for the hills. Mm -hmm. So insecurity always played a part. Of course, I don't know how it can't, you know, when we're, we've been through so much like that, you know. Yeah. And, and when you do finally find something meaningful to you, something wholesome and with oh, the future. I mean, by the time we went from L.A. to New Orleans, and by the time I got to New Orleans, I had been in love for days. Yeah. I had been in love with that man for days, but I dare, wasn't going to dare breathe a word to him that I was in love with him because he would have ran for the hills. <laughs> um, uh, so I just zipped it. I just went for the ride. And um, it got to be tech fast in Detroit. And when when we agreed to backpack across to America together, I said, no, I'm not doing this because I don't want to be a military wife one day. I really like you. And that's not on my bag. And he's like, oh, well, I can just switch squadrons and I won't have to go away anymore. And he made out like he had a choice in the matter all these many moons ago. And mm -hmm. so I took him home with me, fell madly in love. Um, he went back to Britain. A week after he went back, I booked my flight to Britain. And they, you'd never been to Britain before? No. Okay. So I book a flight to Britain. Uh, super exciting. I get here. I got really sick. I got strep throat. And then we went to London. And uh, it was amazing. And I went to... <laughs> I went to um, the Queen's Theatre where Les Mis is. Yep. And I asked the lady, like, how long Les Mis would be in town for. And she looked at me and she said, it's been here for nearly 20 years. I don't think it's going anywhere. Mm. And I just look like an idiot, like a tourist. Mm. And I, I was like, oh. That's okay. You're an American <laughs> and in then, um, the And then I kept saying to Steve, like, like I really want to see that. That's my favorite musical. I really, And we didn't see it. And I was 20 then. Um, and... We did the whole be a tourist thing. I got to meet all his friends here. And then we went on a night out. And the attire for American people on a night out and the attire for British people on a night out are not always the same thing. Yeah. And I thought we were going to a nightclub. We weren't. We were going to like a pub, like a family pub, like darts. And mm -hmm. I dressed like a total hoochie mama in like hot pants high heels and a corset because I thought I was going to a nightclub and all of his friends turn up in jumpers and jeans and I look like a complete idiot and he kept telling me how great I looked I'm like okay no that's not what I meant and 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 this isn't working and I had to go out like that because it was far too late to go all the way back and change what, was, what was the culture shock like so so I'd like I'd, I'd like to ask this question I spoke to um, a gentleman from uh, Boston, actually, Massachusetts, I think, um, a couple of weeks ago, who'd written a book about education. And uh, I always wonder about what is the American perception of Britain? So as an American, what what do you know, if any, <laughs> if anything, about Britain? Is it is it like the Beatles and the Queen or is it nothing or is it like, you know? Yeah, the, yeah, the royalty, the Beatles, the music, a bit. Um, we know nothing about you, mostly. Yeah, that's nothing. what I thought, yeah. It's very, very bizarre. Nothing about the culture, and you can't actually learn the culture without being here and living what here. What about the history? And Any doing of the history? It. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the history, but more like the ancient history. So mm. Romans, mm. all of that, mm. you know, all of that sort of stuff mm. would be we do at school in history and people don't really pay a lot of attention yeah. to it. But we also do a lot of current events in our schools. So if you do have anything like Brexit was a huge thing, our our high school students would have learned about that for okay. sure right. because that's a big international issue. Mm. So any of that kind of stuff, yeah. But like we don't know what Emmerdale is. No. You know, we don't know like I don't think you missed anything there. Yeah, I know, but trivia here. So You've got Baywatch for God's sake. I know. <laughs> All our children is actually what it's called, our version of it. But um, I guess it's more like, it's the way you all interact with each other is very, very different. And it, when you insult each other, it's for a laugh. And it can come across as like, back home, if you said pardon here, it's totally normal, typical. But back home, if you're like, pardon 
they kind of think you have a stick up your butt. Um, yeah. And you're a bit uptight. They're like, what? Mm-hmm. They're re- you're re- you'd be considered like really stuck up mm-hmm. if you spoke that way. Mm-hmm. So your Queen's English here, I guess, would be considered like your more posh speaking, posh way of speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and back home, if if you spoke like a Brit over there, they they'd find you quite rude and standoffish and not very comfortable. Mm-hmm. We're a lot like more robust, more loud. We talk over each other a lot too mm-hmm. and interact in a totally different way. Mm-hmm. And we're much louder. Mm-hmm. Like if, if Michigan's not even that loud. If you go down south, people down there are very loud. We shout. It's sh- almost like you just, it's big. In, it's brash. I always think of America yeah. as kind of like the, America is it's like exciting. The, it's, it's like fresh. The, it's, uh, uh, like a family orientation. America's like yeah. the young kid who's just out there tearing it up because you know the history. You are a younger country, <laughs> and you've kind of developed this crazy kind of. Um, because all the pioneers went there. Everybody went there from all these different countries. You know, people who were prepared to get on a crazy boat and just go across the water and then um, go into yeah, this Yeah, they have to have something about them, don't they, to yeah. even make that journey in the first place. For sure, and then all those um, people. And then when we got there, we had to fight like hack to stay alive to even yeah. live there. That's, yeah. But then it was also built on the pursuit of happiness, which is something Britain was not created on. And British people are so grumpy. Is that what you find, yeah? Oh, my God, you all are miserable. And it's that... You miss you. You don't smile and wave at people. Hey, how are you today, girl? Yeah. How you doing across that street? Yeah, yeah. Across the street, right? And people hear that. Like, Why is she talking to me? Mm. Why is that girl so loud all the time? Mm. I'm gonna go this way. Goddamn Americans! Yeah, pretty much. Um, and like talking on the tube every morning, right? On the way to work, or everybody talking in a queue at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody does that in the states. They don't talk. No, they do. They oh, talk the, a the, lot. In the queue. A lot in the queue. Yeah. And here, I'm like, you guys say like two words. It's very standoffish. Is it? Did you, I mean, obviously we, I'm just talking from a point of view, anticipating other other countries or other, you know, cultures. We always seem to be quite polite. Yeah, you are super polite. But in a weird way, because it's almost like a superficial quite. kind of polite because yeah. like you said, we're not talking to each other in the queue, but we'll say, sorry, 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 sorry to everybody around us in on a cruise ship. Oh, I just touched your elbow. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Or you can be really passive aggressive. Yes. Too. Very passive aggressive. My husband. So he didn't like the spoon. I, I leave my <laughs> teaspoon on the sugar canister. Cause I use the same spoon all day. I'm not going to get a new spoon. I like took the spoon and, Slammed it in the sink and walked away. Instead of being like, love, don't leave your spoon there. It leaves a drip mark. You're not confrontational in the same way. If we don't like something, we just go, don't do that. We don't like it. Yeah, which I think is probably easier. And we expect you guys to do that. And no one ever does it. Mm. So then I'm getting frustrated. I'm going, why do people not like me when Mm. they won't tell me why they don't like me? How did you find you the reception from the Brits to you as a... Somebody coming to live here. As a young American, a daft American, not great right. at all. And I offended a lot of people unintentionally and had no idea I was offending people and saying things that would were considered rude or... But nobody would correct you. Mm. And even if you tried to get to the bottom of it, they would still be hostile to you after that. Like you already burned your bridge. Mm. And when you burn bridges with people here, that's it. Mm-hmm. They write you off forever. Okay. I find the Brits to be less forgiving. Oh, that's interesting. Much less. Like, we tend to be very forgiving in America. Okay. And, and and not hold a grudge about anything, particularly simple things. So, again, something my dad travelled across America when he was a young man, and he said that he was welcomed enormously by the, by the Americans. You know, they hear that British accent, and as you mentioned, you know, too stuffy, then, yeah, you get a pull. But generally speaking, the, the English... They're like, oh, my God, where are you from? Yeah. Come sit and tell me your life story. Mm-hmm. And we're generally like that with everyone, too, not just the Brits. And we genuinely want to hear your life story. And we genuinely care. And mm. some people find it very false, Americans that are super giddy and excited and happy. Mm-hmm. But it's real. It's a different... It's mm. just a different culture. And it's a different way of thinking about things. a very positive view. Mm. And... It's so hard to explain, too, because I didn't get it living here either, especially the humor. Right. So when somebody's picking on you, they probably actually think you're pretty cool. Yeah. 
And yeah, I it's just, very reversed. Oh, like, God, yeah, it's so difficult confusing. when you're trying to flirt when you're like 16. <laughs> what, what do I do? Hit her? Just give her a dead arm? Yeah. I like you. <laughs> uh, yeah, like it was so bizarre. My husband's best friend is very, very dry, has dry humor. Yeah. And I just struggled with it for about three or four years. And I come home crying. He hates me. Why does he always make fun of me? I'm never going to get along with your friends. Maybe I should just go home. <laughs> and then after about three years, then like he said something to me one day. And I just quickly twisted it and gave it back. And he was like, oh, now you get it. Yes. And it, it kind of just clicked. And now we're all good friends now. And now mm -hmm. that I get it, I can engage with that sort of banter. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do have a, my own technique, too. If I don't like your jokes, I won't respond to them. Mm -hmm. I will literally look you straight in the face, blink, and, and totally ignore your joke and let it wash over me. Mm -hmm. And people think that I don't understand British humor sometimes, but it's I just didn't like your humor. Yeah, I'm not having it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I just, no, I don't even acknowledge that it happened, especially if they're taking the piss out of me and I didn't like it. I literally pretend it didn't happen and move on with the conversation. I like your energy. You you adapt, you pivot, you absorb, you positive, you radiant. I imagine, as you've said, a handful at two and a half, and I imagine a handful all the way through. I've always been a handful. So you meet, yeah. you meet the powerful Stephen, the British gent. He's a good guy. He's a handsome devil. He's got all of everything in the right place. You're 20. You guys backpack. You go on a pilgrimage together. You know, you yeah. go on this journey. You create this energy. He comes back here. Then you come over. And I guess that's where the story really kicks in. And, you know, you go on to have a marriage and children. It is, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned, you alluded to before, your first child, you did all the reading, you did all of the planning, you'd learned to all be... All the pushing my husband into it as well. Because we were still kind of young. We'd been married. Yeah, how old were you then when you had... We your... got married at 21. Mm -hmm. And I had seen it at 27. So we spent six years... Partying like rock stars yep. um, and traveling mm. and traveled all over Europe. That's great. So you've got so much um, Dominican that. Republic. Where else did we go? That experience all, together. All, yeah, yeah. But a lot of that time he was away. He spent, uh, as of right now, he's done over 1,200 days in war zones. Whoa. In the last 10 years that I've counted, I think, or 12 years. Mm. Um, so I get to England as a newly married 21-year-old woman. I have no job, no car, no life, no friends. I don't know where I am in the world at all. I rock up with five... Were you in Lincoln at that Five point? suitcases. No, I was at Odium near Basingstoke. Right. I rock up with five suitcases. I get detained and deported. Okay, interesting. Because we filled out the wrong visa paperwork. And the lady's like, oh, yeah, our website's wrong. And it keeps telling everybody to fill out the wrong paperwork. And I'm like... Great. That's Thanks. really helpful. So it's a tragedy, lots of lost money on flights. I go home for two months, finally get my visa, come back. I arrive Christmas morning, 2007. And that's when I entered the country as a permanent British resident. Um, Boxing Day was a novelty. I woke up at like four in the morning starving on Boxing Day. And I'm like, come on, babe, we got to go get some food. Like, you don't even have pans in this house. Like, we got to go get food, like, right now. He's like, nothing's open. It's Boxing Day. What the heck is Boxing Day? And why can't I have food on it? What is Boxing Day? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah like, I, I had no idea that everything was going to be closed. I had no idea that you had Boxing Day. I yeah. had, and then he takes me surfing in Wales the following week for mm. New Year's. Mm -hmm. Surfing. Surfing in Wales for New Year's. That's pretty chilly then. Yeah, no kidding. The Welsh Sea tried to kill me. It was like 25 mile an hour winds, 14 foot swells, freezing. I just come from the Caribbean. I'm like, no, this is not surfing. This is not what I recall surfing to be like. This is freezing. When the first wave hit my face, <laughs> I just, I just, I thought the whole thing was going to crack apart and just break into a million pieces mm. and shatter like ice. It was so cold and so brown and so horrible. And I, was, <laughs> and I was just like, what the heck? And then I didn't know they spoke Welsh. So some old lady at the grocery yeah, store shouting language. at me in Welsh. And I'm like, oh, my, what did I do to her? Why is she yelling at me? I need to go home now. I'm so confused. I'm yeah. in Wales. Yeah. I didn't know it was a separate country. I, and then they told me it was fancy dress. So I put on high heels and I, I didn't bring a dress. So I put on like 
trouser smart clothes because I thought it fancy, fancy dress. dress. Yeah, yeah. And I walk in this pub and they're all speaking Welsh and they're dressed like mummies and pirates. And I'm like, oh, seriously, I'm brain fried. Like I can't handle anymore. What the f- is going on? Like, I don't know what's going on. They're speaking a foreign language. I didn't know England had a foreign language. It's not England, love. I'm like, well, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, I don't know where I am. There's a lot going on for you. Isn't it there? really was. And then I, I did end up settling in not very well. So Stephen had a whole history and a whole life on a base, a military base, that he would, he'd been there for seven years and then brought his new wife. And that did not work. Okay. The, just dynamics all wrong. Just the dynamic was so wrong. He still wanted to act like one of the single lads and go off to war zones and drink like a fish and, go, mm. and be a young lad because we were so young when we got married. It caused a lot of conflict. I'm going, wait, you said we were going to travel the world together. You buggering off to Afghanistan is not us traveling the world. Mm. And he left me alone a lot, a lot. Eight months the first year. Seven months the second year, six months the third year. And by the third year, I had had enough. And I said, you either switch squadrons or figure something out or no, no more. I can't. Mm. I was like, you're away too much. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. And I'm the worst military wife. Honestly, I just. From the minute we got together, I never wanted to be a military. Yeah, you kind of pointed that out. I really did not. And I still don't like it to this day. At all. There are a lot of great benefits. He's had an amazing education. They were really fabulous when I had my kids and had some difficulties. He did a lot of working from home when Nika was very, very tiny and in the hospital. But other than that, no. Mm -hmm. uh, It's not worth it. It's, It's just, I respect what the lads do, but... I can't get behind waiting around like that mm. for there's, somebody there's so else much time a apart war. from a family as well. You know, it's difficult. He missed it? so much. He missed so much of my kids' lives. Mm. He missed so much of our life. I was so lonely and sad, and I had to go through some really tough things without him. Mm-hmm. And I did not like that, and I'm still pretty cross about it. Actually, mm. I kind of, but at the same time, it's so conflicting because I know he's doing something for the community mm-hmm. that directly affects the entire community and promotes safety of my own family. So then am I even allowed to be mad at him about it? That he's away so, so much? So difficult. It's such a difficult situation. Am I supposed situation. to just suck it up because that's my job as a military wife? Mm-hmm. It's very conflicting. Um, and at every stage when I wanted to go home, he would be like, yeah, let's do it. And then he changed his mind. No, I'm, I'm too comfortable. I have to stay. I have to stay for the pension. I have to stay for the... Security. I want to feed the family. I have to stay. I have to stay. And we're now coming up to the transition where in four years he finishes his career and we're moving abroad. Okay. Where? Who knows? Throw a spot. See what happens. Who knows? Wherever we can grow our vegetables, mostly. Well, that's another for people who can keep up with this. (laughs) (laughs) I know, right? We're not there yet. one One of the other things that really intrigues me is... You mentioned the fashion design and you making wedding dresses and you yeah. you turn your hand to a lot of things. But what really interests me is you're a mushroom farmer. I am. That is my current job is I am setting up a full commercial mushroom farm. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been interested in mushrooms for many, many years. So when I lived in that car in the parking lot at the library, I used to study natural medicine and Eurovedic healing in books, in the car, because what else did I have to do, right? In a library car park. <laughs> in a library car park. Um, <laughs> and I got really interested in natural medicine because I um, was working as a waitress and got a urinary tract infection. It cost me $150 to walk through the door of the office of a doctor to get a prescription for antibiotics. That's mm. before the prescription. That's before even seeing the man. Just to go through the door. Just to walk through the door to see a doctor. And I was poor. I was a waitress going to uni. I was a poor kid. Mm-hmm. I was surviving on like potatoes and soup and white bread, you know, yep. <laughs> like yep. restaurant meals that the chefs would make me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started, yes, yeah, just studying lots of natural medicine and um, just really loved growing things. My Both my grandmothers grew things in the garden and my grandfather grew peppers and it's kind of in America, it's kind of everybody grows something. They all grow food of some sort. Everybody has their little tomato pans or peppers because they grow outdoors too. We don't really need a greenhouse for yeah. most of them. Mm. Different climate to here. It's not as hard to do. It's pretty easy mm. stateside. Um, and so 
the market garden started a lot sooner than the mushroom farm. But the mushroom interest started first, really. Stephen and I used to do a lot of walks with our first dog. Uh, nice big Rottweiler, Leo. Dumbest dog ever. Beautiful, soft. He would hit his dang head on the kitchen table every day, though. Every day. He was just daft and soft. And one time he drug me across the field, you know, after mm -hmm. a girl dog when he was very young. And mm -hmm. he was a nightmare. He chewed a lot of stuff up. Absolutely terrible dog. Mm -hmm. Never get one again. Terrible, lovely dog. I, grew, I, I grew loved up with him. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I, that was my best friend because, of course, Steve was away all the time. It was mm -hmm. just me and Leo for five years. Wow. And we just hung out and did every. He would. I would stumble home drunk. He'd take me home through the field. From Both be eating cushions when we got. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was the best dog. Only the worst dog because we were the worst owners. Right. That's really what it was. So he didn't get trained properly. He ate my shoes. He ate my husband's very expensive vinyl records one time. Mm. Oh, that, yeah, white label. You come home to them. You come home. He was in Afghanistan, and I had to call his best friend, and I called this lad Dippy that I don't know very well. And I'm like, Dippy, what do I do? Like, it, it, the dog ate his records, and he's like, those are exclusive white label records that are never been printed again. You're never getting them. Like, you're never going to get your hands on them. Give up now, love. Don't tell him till he gets home. Mm. So he had to, I waited until he got home <clears throat> to tell him the dog ate his records. He was not a happy man. He also ate my pictures from the cruise ship. So all my pictures from the Caribbean, the whole, like, photo album is, like, half eaten around the side. <laughs> like, the dog was a jerk. But yeah, we did a lot of foraging. So it started with blackberries, raspberries, all the typical stuff. Um, military bases are huge for having fruit trees because of post-war era. Mm. I mean, during the war, they planted tons and tons of fruit trees to feed the people. Mm -hmm. In the 40s, that was a thing you had to plant to eat. Yeah, of course. And that's how I learned all this. So my gay gay was from the war era. She taught me how to pressure can food. She taught me how to peel tomatoes and... And jar tomatoes, canned tomatoes, and her cousin had a farm, and we'd sit there, and we'd cook them and peel them and jar them all, and and then Nana taught me to cook quite a lot, too. So then I'm doing all this growing and cooking and hanging laundry out, like I'm a 1940s housewife as a kid with the grandmothers, and then I'm out foraging with the husband, so I decided to get a dehydrator, and I decided to get a pressure cooker, and I'm going to make jam, and I start making all these jams, and we start brewing wine and beer. Oh, wow. And we did that for a while, which I don't recommend. Some of the cranberry raspberry wine is a little too potent for me. Is it? Oh, yeah. I ended up stuck behind a sofa. <laughs> but I can't decide if that's because the wine was strong or I was an alcoholic. One of the two. Yeah. One of the two. Yeah. Some combination <laughs> of something up there. Yeah. So uh, we did all this brewing and then I hosted a little brewing class for the military wives so I could teach them how to make six bottles of white wine with grape juice for Mazda. <laughs> I bet they fucking love that. Didn't they? they did. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, get in. 50p a bottle. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. 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 That was the main objective is make wine as cheap and tasty as I could. Mm. And I learned how to do that. Um, and then we did a lot of Growing, we started planting. I started with beans and I planted these beans and the French dwarf beans <laughs> mostly, mostly through seeds at the floor to begin with. Like, I tried to plant leeks and tree roots, that was never gonna work, no. like ever. And I knew nothing about it, but I just kept digging mostly, was the thing. I just kept digging, kept trying, kept plotting. Um, and here we are, god, it's been it'll be 14 years in October. Um, and we have had 13 seasons of growing. We had an allotment at one point that we grew a year's worth of food on an allotment. Cool. And we've just progressed and progressed and progressed into what is now our homestead. And it's a 60 square meter micro market garden and a mushroom farm. And I'm a professional face painter. So, you know, the whole grandma's a clown thing. I like you just drop that in there. Just, so just, just, just. I learned to face paint to help grandma out and yeah. be in the circus with her when I was 15. Um, and then I would paint at jobs for her on the weekends when I was young to earn extra cash. So I've been face painting since I was like five on the front porch for 50p, you know, mm -hmm. neighborhood kids come over. 
And I, I stole the quartz out of grandma's front yard, too, and sold that to the neighbor, too. <laughs> like the little rocks, like with my fake cash register. <laughs> and I was like, 50, 50 cents, get your face painted? You want a quartz, rose quartz? Yeah, 50 cents. Oh, and I hit, like right You've in the driveway. been the whole time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I have this baby, and I have to quit my job because he was an early baby. So Stephen and I decided to have the kids. We have Sienna. I have PTSD so bad. Yeah, you mentioned this earlier. So After Sienna's birth. With all of that learning you were doing. Oh, it was awful. And then you have, you have, and, and it's such a shame for me to hear because my wife's a doula and I've become really. Aware of birth trauma. Yeah, and mm. birthing full stop and what a beautiful, wonderful, gifting thing it is. And previously I'd only have like most people, not just men. I think like a lot of people, you just think, oh my God, I'm going to have a baby. It's going to kill. It's going to be horrible. I'm going to have to get epi epidural. Oh, it doesn't have to be like that. No, it and really I've learned doesn't. a lot through my wife. So to know that you kind of had the foresight amongst all that chaos and all that madness to to want to bring a child into the into the world is, is kind of naturally and as presently and as consciously as you could. Yeah, yeah. I planned on home birthing my first baby. Um, I did not get to do that. No. And I had a midwife, unfortunately, that bullied me into going to hospital because I was strep B positive. Right. And if you know anything about strep B positive baby, a healthy full-term baby um, is the odds of that baby is one in a thousand which is nothing hmm. that's considered extremely low risk for Down syndrome. But because strep B is a fast killer, they take it more seriously. Of course. But the problem with that is people don't really understand strep B. Just because you have it one day doesn't mean you have it the next. So explain it's to people. It's transient. Yeah. It's a transient bacteria that lives on your skin. Hmm. If a baby contracts it, it will kill them quickly. But if it's on the baby or on you, it doesn't cause any harm. And it comes and goes. It's some, it's a normal thing that lives all over. And I got diagnosed with it. So the hospital policy right now and standard policy right now in Lincolnshire, and it has been this way for a very long time, is that you have to have two doses of IV antibiotics before the baby is born to try and prevent the baby from getting strep B and mm -hmm. becoming a strep B positive baby. The problem with that is that a healthy full-term pregnancy is, risk is very low. Pumping yourself full of antibiotics pre-birth automatically wipes you and your kid's immune system out, yes, which not. is awful. Mm. I didn't want a hospital birth to begin with. I didn't want medical inter intervention to begin with. And then I did a really deaf thing, and I was lounging days before labor, leaning right back, and I watched my perfectly positioned baby flip back to back. Uh. And I had a back to back labor that went on and on and on. For four whole days. I went into the hospital on Thursday night is when I went into labor. And then they sent me home and I went back Friday night. And they kept me in because it was a foot of snow outside. And I had to have these antibiotics. So I'm in there. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Like two days later, and I'm still contracting. <laughs> Awful back-to-back -back contractions as well, like the worst of the worst. Oh, God. Every three minutes, the entire three days. And it's, I think that it's like Saturday night, late, almost Sunday, and my friend's like, oh, I bet you're going to have her on Monday. And I just like, I was like, I want to throw punch you. Why would you say that? Tomorrow's Sunday. Why do you want me to make go through a whole nother day of this? And then it's all day Sunday. Have you had her yet? Have you got uh, well, who takes this long to have a baby? No mm. one takes this long to have a baby. I'm like, damn lord, midwife, why am I taking so long to have a baby? Mm. And then Monday rolls around and I got this beautiful doctor, beautiful, beautiful lady, and she says, Look, I want to try something, but you have to have an epidural to do it. You have to agree to an epidural, or I cannot do it. I want to reach inside and turn your baby 180 degrees. Wow, fuck. <laughs> like, okay, you're crackers. I was like, okay, let's try it. I'm done. I'm exhausted. They haven't let me eat in four days. I haven't slept in four days. I've had nothing but water. They won't even let me have juice in case I need to be operated on. Mm -hmm. So no food for four days. You have no strength to have a baby after no food for four days. That's a deep, dark. Yeah, um, my wife's just recently been part of a labor with the COVID rules and everything. And a girl had a similar, she's been contracting for about four days and just... The, the difficulty. The, you're the so hungry and you're so delusional by that point mm. that you just need it to stop. 
everything. So they give me this epidural, and I'm like, wow, that's a relief. I can't feel anything. Is Stephen around? Is Stephen with you? Oh, Steve's with me through the whole thing, and he's Amazing. a deer in headlights. Like, I don't know what to do. Mm. And I won't let him go anywhere. So for four days, he just keeps putting on aftershaves so that he doesn't smell of sweat because I won't actually let him leave. Because every time he tries to walk out the door, I'm like, don't go. I'm contracting again. Get away from me. Come back. Get yes. away. Get, touch, that is touch exactly me. Come back. what I did through the entire labor. And I must have had 40 baths and walked back and forth. Bath, no bath, bath, no bath. Mm. Um, and he kept putting this aftershave on. And I'm trying to, like, hug him and pull him in. I'm like, you stink. You smell of so much aftershave. I don't... <sighs> Like, it's so gross, but I'm struggling. And it was a huge battle. Um, and this this little lady, she she finally reaches in there, turns this baby. I see all these legs flop over, flop around. And she pulls her hand out and jumps up and down. And she goes, it worked, it worked. And, I'm, and then she goes, oh, I'm so sorry, y'all. I'm, she's like, that never works, but it worked. You're going to have a baby really soon. She's small. It'll be, She'll be right out. I'm off work now. I've been waiting to see what I could do with you. And it's shift change. So she leaves. Wow, that's like, a weird exchange then. So she kind of mm. does that with you, which is about as intimate. Just literally as... like. Yeah. And I, I could feel her grab the baby's head and I could feel her just, I could feel it just turn around. All the legs, everything kind of swept across my whole body. Wow. It was perfect and amazing. Mm. And then after that happened, I was in, well, I couldn't feel anything anyway because the epidural but I could tell it was far more comfortable. The baby was in the correct position. Yeah, yeah. And I was no longer in the really tense pains that I was having. Mm. Um, she leaves and the next three hours go to absolute toffee. So after she moved the baby, baby gets de -steth. Typical, you just turned her. Nobody reached in there before. Of course she's going to de -steth. So I don't agree with their treatment plan. And they send in the consultant and this consultant barges in and he's yelling at my midwives get that monitor on her why isn't the monitor on correctly and it's because i'm moving because i don't want to be tied down and these girls are getting yelled at a midwife and a training midwife are now crying in my room while i'm trying to deliver wow, that, a baby that's some mad excess trauma then to what to deal with <laughs> this guy comes in and he proceeds to watch these desats not be comfortable with it and decide that he is Going to take me for a C-section. I was like, no, you're not. I you was, told him. I was like, no, you're not. Oh, yeah, I told him. And then he fought with me. And I'm literally in the middle of delivery. I'm having contractions, and I'm fully dilated, and I'm literally trying to push the baby out. And Steve's like, oh, I can see her head. And this idiot is trying to argue with me about using forceps and, and having a C-section, even though my baby is coming out. Mm. They're like, she doesn't need anything. I'm like, why is he in here? Why are you crying? Why are all these people in here? I thought you were delivering my baby. Like, why is he here? And this man proceeds to bully me until I agree to use Von Tuss, which I was not happy about. I did not want any intervention to begin with. Mm -hmm. The DSATs were minimal. And I know this because I actually purchased all of my medical notes and filed a lawsuit after the birth did that you? I never went through with. Right. Um, and then he bullied me and bullied me and bullied me. He convinced me to get Von Tuss, but in the medical world, I'm sure you'll be aware, any decision that gets made is supposed to be made with informed consent. Exactly. So I had no idea what Von Tuss was. I had to ask. He told me it was a suction cup that went on the baby's head. He did not tell me he needed an entire tray of sharp tools. These tools come in. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm going to give you a episiotomy. I said, you're not giving me an episiotomy. Why? Oh, I can't use Von Tuss if I don't. Well, then you should have told me that. Don't you dare. Well, you're tearing. Yes, I know. That's what happens when you shit out a baby. Mm -hmm. Love. Do not cut me. And then she comes out, luckily, without Von Tuss or anything else. Even though in my notes it says Von Tuss. He basically nearly got it on her. And she came out anyway. She comes out, she's supposed to go straight onto my stomach, doesn't read my birth notes, takes my baby, doesn't put her on my stomach, and then I'm screaming at him, do not cut the cord, don't cut the cord. He looks right at me, laughs, cuts the cord. He laughs? And says, oops, I already have. 
Whoa. And walks away with my baby. At this point, I'm screaming, give me my baby now. That's... Freaking out. No one will tell me anything. So what he was took his... my baby. Why, why was he so stressing? And they took her to a table to be checked over because she supposedly had meconium in pooped in the womb on the way out. So they're checking over the baby, and then they take her straight to NICU, and they give this baby an APGAR score of nine. Now, after having a premature baby, I know damn well that no baby with an APGAR score of nine needs to go to the NICU for any reason. Then they won't let me see my baby for five hours. So they stole my baby. They won't let me see her. They refuse to let her have my breast milk that I pre-expressed before birth that I, because I left it in the car. Even though it was frozen because it was a foot of snow outside, they could not possibly use any logic and let my child have my milk as her first milk. They wouldn't let me breastfeed her. They wouldn't bring me a breast pump. And I'm still laid open on a table and can't move because they lost a towel. And they're counting these towels over and over again for five hours. And then they finally stitch me up. And I find out that he gave me an episiotomy against my will, without my consent. And I have to be sewn up quite badly. And that was awful. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Oh, yeah, he came back before they sewed me up, actually, to check for the placenta. And I had been told my placenta came out whole repeatedly, and he still felt the need to reach inside and check for my placenta. Which, from my understanding, is just beyond inappropriate and no, and if it came out whole and there's no reason to go looking for it and if it didn't come out whole you wouldn't go looking for it like that you would go straight to theater because you can bleed out so why what was the bad step with this gentleman then what is was he having a bad day is this guy clock did watching. Have a reputation or anything or? yes he had a reputation he was clock watching he wanted that baby out so he could get on to the next patient um and I met a midwife at my allotment who also had an allotment who wasn't my midwife, but I was informed two years later that he's never going to deliver a baby again. He's Mm. been forced out of the hospital and had his license removed. Wow. So that gave me some reassurance many, many years later. And how about your bond then with your little girl? How did... Oh my God, it traumatized me so badly that I wouldn't let her go. So shop, I was shopping one day and I let go of the pram and Steve took the pram and went around the corner and I freaked out in that Mm. shop when I thought my baby was gone like Mm. full blown freak out screaming at him in the middle of the store like don't ever steal my baby again (laughs) like and he's like it's my baby too and I'm like no (laughs) I'm like no it's my baby (laughs) and I did get uh, for a while a little bit like especially at the beginning I was very poorly my stitches burst I was very poorly from that um from being caught and left open like that I got an infection yeah he was away a lot and I was there with the baby on my own the whole time and yeah it was not a nice time for me it was probably the darkest time of my life was two years after my daughter was born Mm -hmm. um And not because of her at all, because actually we bonded really well and I took parenting very seriously and I was there every step of the way. I was real nappies, carried the baby. She slept in my bed. I breastfed her till she was three, Mm -hmm. the whole kit and caboodle. And I took to it like a duck to water motherhood. Um, And then I started processing my own stuff and I was drinking really heavily after the PTSD. Right. Really heavily (coughs) when she was about two years old. And... It was, I just said, if I can't control my drinking and make a choice about my drinking three times in a row, then that's it. I'll quit drinking forever. Of course, so the whole family history Mm. and everything else leading up to this point. And then I made an absolute ass of myself at a couple of different occasions, like special occasions in front of people too, and cursing and just not being ladylike. And that's my taxi, not your taxi. And just... Mm nightmarish stuff um so right after i had nico i went teetotal and i've been sober four years good on you man and that was that i just drew a line in the sand and walked away from that forever and that's when i started when i had cni i started the education probably around nutrition health and well-being well even further back really to Mm. living in my car and studying Mm. the natural medicine 
And then all these tiny pieces of this puzzle all the way through have led up to me now running a micro market garden and mushroom farm here in Lincolnshire. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing all kinds of crazy, silly, fun stuff with it, like a kids growing club. So awesome. That's cool. It's really cute. It comes out on April 23rd, which is actually my four year sober date. I'm launching my business on that day. That's amazing. What a fairy um, tale that is. And so in the last four years, I built and grew two businesses. Um, when I moved to England, when I moved to Lincoln, particularly after living in Basingstoke, um, I had just started my firefighting career. <laughs> and I did that for five years. The whole time I was having children and everything, my whole that whole turbulent time, in the background, my husband was doing an engineering degree, and I was a firefighter. <laughs> for, <laughs> We're going to have to do like another six hours. I we? know, right? Um, and I was doing this retained firefighting, and I trained, and I trained with the lads, and I loved it, and I loved getting as close to the fire as I could. Melting my helmet was like the best bit of all of it. If I could get close enough to a hot enough fire that my glass started to melt, that's what I loved. And I was all gung-ho, but of course, I had a premature baby, five years later, and that was that. That was firefighting over. Mm. In that one one incident meant that I had to become a stay-at-home mom and I had to raise a disabled child. And that meant I couldn't be rushing off in the middle of the night with a kid at home that nobody else can look after. And the whole journey has taken me to a place in my life um, after having the kids where I'm poorly, I'm fat, I'm like, I used to be a firefighter. I used to kick butt. Like, I was strong. I could lift ladders. I could run for days. I could do so everything. When you got, when you, what made you decide to be firefighting and do firefighting? You're just like, that sounds exciting. I know. I did it like I do everything else. I fell into it. Mm. I, uh, I started my career in the UK as a cleaner, and then I didn't like that. Of course, it was gross. Um, and then I became a tile saleswoman because I did that in the States for a little while before I had left. After the cruise ship, I was selling tile before I left when I had like my little apartment and making arrangements for the wedding. Um, so I did that here for a bit and didn't really like it because back home I was front of house designing and here I was unloading pallets. <laughs> and yeah, I was like, difference, I'm like oh, God, I don't want to do this dirty bit at the back. And um, I got a few injuries. I ripped all the muscles off my chest one time throwing bags of adhesive, 20 kilo bags of adhesive. Yeah. Um, and on my way to work, so I found it really difficult to get a license and a driving license, even though I've been driving for six years. My husband had a Mitsubishi GTO twin turbo car that cost 3,500 pounds a year for insurance for me to be on it. Yeah, and he was like, no way. It's a fucking rocket. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm from Detroit. Like, we have the fastest, coolest cars in the world, and I've drove loads of them. Like, what do you mean it depends on the car? Surely it depends on how hard I push the gas pedal. And I just could not understand the concept in Britain that you can't own a nice, fancy car. Or fast car, particularly. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't matter how fast the car goes. It matters how fast you drive the car. Mm -hmm. But here, your insurance premium yeah. it, it relates directly to the horsepower, mm -hmm. which I found bizarre. I was like, this is stupid. I'm in a right half. Mm -hmm. So I decided to get my CBT and get a bike. <laughs> so I got a motorcycle. And um, I'm riding this 125, this little, um, it was a Honda 125. And I'm cruising to Farnham and back every day about 15 or 20 miles and I got this big hill I like to go down and I could get 82 miles an hour <laughs> if I duck down really low full yeah, and I'm flying to work and back and um, I had three accidents in three months on the bike on the bike yeah I come around a corner one day and at the bottom of the hill there was an accident and everybody slammed on their brakes and I went straight into the back of somebody I just threw my bike on the floor and jumped out the way. Wow. And it frightened me. Yeah. And that day, the man who picked up my bike was a firefighter recruiter. I was like, you ever thought about being a firefighter? I'm like, I just got in a motorcycle accident. No. Yeah, how did how's that question pop up? Because he said I'm waited with me for a van to come get me. Oh, so okay. uh, loaded the bike up in my mate's So van. he must have picked up on your energy and just thought, you know what? You're doing this really well. I think he's really a recruiter. Well. He was just trying his luck to recruit anybody he can. It's a tough job. Right. And they are always looking for help. 
The really? firefighters struggle to keep staff. What's that down to then? It's just the, the nature of the hours? The money. The money. The money. So most firefighters are retained now. Mm. And you only get paid when you get called out. And it's a huge time commitment. You have to be within five mm. minutes of your station. Mm. So you have to be at home and available a lot of hours a week. They mm. require a lot of hours out of you. Mm. Um, and you're not necessarily working those hours, so you're not getting paid, but you have to keep yourself available. You can't touch, go yeah, to the pub. Like a limbo, kind of. Yeah, and it's a hard life with kids and a military husband. I had to get no pair just to be on call. So I had to have someone come live in to look after Sienna for me, a Spanish au pair. And then you're getting into the paying out to bring money in to I'm not be with your kids. I'm paying 90 quid a week for an au pair. Mm. And then I'm not making very much money, but I'm loving it. So mm. I don't want to stop. Mm. And my career is progressing. Did you, did you, did you get into any kind of... Difficult situations with that then, pulling people out of fires and stuff No, like I was very fortunate and unfortunate, pay-wise unfortunate. We almost have a sixth sense of humor where if people don't get hurt, we don't get paid. Mm. Um, I did go out to the prison riots. That was a bit of a shock. So they sent us out to the immigration prison riot, and I saw the police get in their full formation, bashing dogs the whole lot they're marching in in their lines and we're right behind them putting out fires and mm. that place was insane i'm like you're sending me in there they haven't even seen a woman in three years like you're not a woman you're a firefighter get in there and put the fire out and i'm like okay cool mm. and that was it and no you don't really get to do the whole be a superhero thing like you think you do mm. but you do get to do a lot of like good and help a lot of people and learn and a lot and I've actually saved more people not being a firefighter than I have being a firefighter just on the streets, just because I'm trained and I can help people. I do. Yeah. So I have a local guy. Um, everybody knows him in the neighborhood. He's a drunk. And I've had to put him in recovery position and call ambulances a few times. And sometimes I walk him to the liquor store to get more booze. Or sometimes I walk him home and shut his heat off so he don't burn the house down or put a cigarette out. Mm. Um, all sorts of people, people in injuries. I helped a kid that got hit by a lorry one time on the side of the road. And Jesus, I do. I am a good Samaritan, so I will stop. If I see anything in the neighborhood going on, mm -hmm. I'm the person that jumps out of their car. Oh, that, that's awesome to have you in the neighborhood. I don't like it when it's chaotic like that. Or, you know, this poor guy, he's a vet. He drinks. He, you know, he just wants his booze. I just walk him there and back and mm. he doesn't mess with anybody. He's harmless. Mm. It's sad. He won't go to AA, I've offered. And there's nothing more I can do there. Mm. Mm. But so I just do these things. I don't even think about it. It's just I follow that intuition on what I should be doing, my own morality, my own moral compass. And I do what needs to be done. I love that. I and love then that I think attitude. about it later. I love that attitude. And, and as you were saying, you know, in those four years of like, real sort of self-education learning holistically about health well-being you know raising your children i learned about a, a lot about the medical thing from being lives trained as well so that kind of tied into being a mother so i was live certified which is the first aid and um first responder so i was actually a first responder for a little while as well mm. um and that made me feel a lot more confident as a mother having yeah. some medical training yeah and knowing what to do in an emergency situation. Do you know, I've often thought, and it's something I got very close to doing my little building business when I had a, a reasonable sized team. I thought, you know what, we all need to get on a first aid course because I've been at raves before. I've been places where people have gone down and you're stood there and you're helpless. And, and no one knows what to do either. You know, or they do the wrong things and you're like, please stop doing it. What that. I found really awkward was like, I knew that they, there's some really simple things to do here yeah, yeah, that yeah. I don't know how to do. Yeah, and open airways, move mm. people's heads and put them in recovery position and check their pulse and capillaries and stuff like that is the first few steps. And mm. if you get that out of the way before the ambulance crew turn up, mm. you can tell them mm. this is what's this, this, this mm. and this. And they mm. have, if you can get any information out of a patient, too. So when they last a mm. birthday, mm. anything like that is mm. always helpful. Mm. Um, so it has come in handy. And actually, some of the other things it comes in handy for is now mushroom farming. I use a lot of isopropyl alcohol and a lot of cleaning techniques. And we did all of our um, hazmat training. And I'm now working in a microbiological lab. So clean down procedure is exactly the same for hazmat. 
as what it is for clean down for the lab. So when I'm growing mushrooms and I'm taking tissue samples from a mushroom, I have to be completely sterile and I have to work with a laminar flow hood. So it blows clean air through the HEPA filter in the space so that no particles can get in. And then we take our tissue samples and recolonize it on agar. And that level of clean and being able to achieve that level of cleanliness in a lab setting like that and build a lab like that, I got that skills and knowledge directly from firefighting. So, okay, the mushroom farming business now, which is your new baby we're going to launch um, on your, your sober date. Yeah. What's it called? Where do we find it? What's the journey been? And tell us about the mushrooms. Uh, I started studying mushrooms out in the field, hiking. Um, and then I started eating wild mushrooms seven years after that. After seven years of finding them, cataloging them, and being confident I knew what they were. Yeah, because that's, that's a tricky yes. bit. So without a spore print, a lot of mushrooms, you cannot tell them from a dangerous mushroom. And uh, and so I I, <laughs> I had all these. Interesting encounters during the mushroom foraging, of course, as you do as a crazy American girl that's out mushroom foraging on officers' quarters on a military base. Mm -hmm. And I'm there looking at this mushroom on some lady's lawn one day, and she has an absolute fit. What are you doing on my lawn? Leave my mushrooms alone. And she's right nasty person to me. And I'm like, I'm just cataloging it. Well, that's not yours. And this is my grass. And a, a woman's castle, a woman's home is her castle and all this mm -hmm. garbage. And I'm like... Mm -hmm go home in a half and she's very british yeah and i go back the next day and her dog is like barking at me i'm like i think we got off on the wrong foot and she's like yeah we did stay away from my mushrooms and like slams the door in my face and she's a wretched oh, woman and then wow. tells the whole day i'm a crazy mushroom lady which i am mm -hmm. um and i'm still in a huff to this day and that's like i think that must be six years ago <laughs> like i'm still cross because she was like i'm gonna eat those for dinner and i'm like well i think it's a brown roll rim and you don't know mm. anything about mushrooms clearly and i just want to do a freaking spore print to find out because i think it's deadly and there's not many deadly mushrooms so it's kind of cool to find one mm. um but I'm, I'm still holding a grudge about this character um and i've i'm writing a comic book about mushrooms for kids okay so you're you are writing a comic book Yes, with a partner, an so, illustration artist. So is this with a view to kind of educating kids and bringing the mushroom knowledge? In mycology, knowledge? absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. Whole so mushrooms are a superfood, yep. and we'll talk a little more about that later. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of science that comes with mushrooms. Mm -hmm. But really, I want to create some joy and happiness around science and joy about the future and joy about the planet surviving. Mm. because mushrooms can be a huge piece of that puzzle to actually recolonize the soil, which then helps the bugs, helps the birds, helps the humans. And the soil degradation is immense right now. It's mm. awful. Mm. Um, we're losing ground, literally losing ground every day. I've had a report recently that, that stated that we might only have 60 years of cycle left and i thought jesus christ but then not less said that. if you take into account the water degradation as well and the sea degradation and the nutritional degradation last 30 years max really how old are your kids uh seven five and oh so they're going to be trying to seven, start their families seven, six and right three. as everything starts to collapse as mm. if we don't do anything about it mm. Terrifying, right? Yeah. Terrifying thought. Big, big heavy weight on people's shoulders is save this planet. How? Mm. Mm. Part of the solution is mycelium. The mycelium network that runs underground communicates with the land. It holds moisture. It creates an incredibly complex network, a microbiome. And that microbiology, all of those living things in that microbiology are what feeds the entire planet. So all the bugs, all of the microbes interact with all the bugs, interact with all the mycelium, interact with all the roots of all the plants. And you then create this amazing network that thrives. And you actually put in more than you take out, but they produce a large amount of protein, zinc, magnesium, calcium, mm -hmm. and vitamin D, mm -hmm. and polysaccharides, which polysaccharides carry all the nutrition where it needs to go essentially and the ones that are in the types of mushrooms i'm growing break the blood brain barrier 
They're so, so tiny. And it's one of the only superfoods that can do that. So they're doing new studies now all the time with mushrooms, lots and lots of mushrooms on trying to heal spinal cord damage from epidurals or traumatic brain injuries, things like this. So because it can help heal neurological disability, they're looking to these mushrooms going, how, why can Mm. we prove it? Mm. And there's studies all over right now about the fact that mushrooms are a superfood and have been heavily overlooked and their ecological impact on the earth growing them is so minute. It's like it doesn't exist compared to beef. Mm -hmm. I mean, beef is a disgusting practice. You've got a cow that needs a piece of land that you grow vegetable on to feed to the cow and you need the piece of land that the cow lives on. Mm -hmm. And you have to produce a lot of food for that cow and then that cow produces very little food for you. And in mushrooms, it's all very simple. And because you can clone them very easily, I clone mushrooms at home. Wow. It's easy. Easily done. I could take one suitcase to any village in anywhere and take enough stuff that they could produce mushrooms pretty much forever. So, okay. So your your research, your reading about mushrooms... Has it just come from the foraging? Has it been accumulation of like the whole... um... The whole thing. Save the planet one day at a time. Right. Save the planet one day at a time and save the people with it. And teach your kids something different. And find your protein and your nutrition. Because I got so sick and so fat after the babies. And I started eating a heavy like Mediterranean diet, only not the good kind. I started eating lots of... French cheeses, lots of salami, lots of ham, lots of... They're all heavily processed. They all have Mm. carcinogens in. Mm -hmm. And I essentially went from being pretty much a vegetarian to an omnivore with lots of meat and cheese. And I poisoned myself, like, with food. Mm. Um, And I now know they've... I've had every test run under the sun. I've been very poorly for six years and in excruciating pain, joint pain, Inflammation, mouth ulcers, dry eyes, loss of vision, sores, blisters, and do you think infections. Is that like accumulation of trauma and just the journey you've <laughs> yeah. been on? And just <laughs> some of it is trauma. So I have some pinched nerves in my neck and spine because I literally carry weight on my shoulders that causes all my muscles to tense up and pull my spine out of place. Mm. Poor posture. Because I have anxiety sometimes, so then I crunch up my whole body and Mm. get anxious and nervous and self-conscious, and it hurts. It physically hurts your body when you feel like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I also got lazy after being so very physically active and snorkeling and surfing and firefighting and doing all of this crazy extreme sports and being super active. And then to sit around for an and I sat around for a good three years breastfeeding a baby and still firefighting, but I was barely hacking it. I had to go to the gym. I had to buffen up again after I had the baby. Um, And then after Nico, again, I did not carry well either one of the children. I put on 40 pounds each time. That's a lot. Mm. I didn't feel good. Nico came early and I lost two in between that and I lost one weight late. So 14 weeks, second trimester loss. Um. And when Nico came early, I spent 55 days every day, 14 hours a day in NICU, feeding that baby through a tube and cleaning him and and watching this tiny baby that I could hold in one hand get big enough to leave the hospital. So I, I put my own health aside for almost four years because Nico had so many health conditions. He had a hole in his heart, brain bleed. He got neurovirus when he was six weeks old and had to be repeatedly resuscitated. I gave him neurovirus and I was at home quarantine thinking I killed my own baby in the hospital. It was awful. And then um, I finally got him almost to the point where he was going to come home. And he stopped eating, and they had to put a feeding tube back in him. And like, oh, it was heartbreaking. He was days away from getting home, and I still couldn't have my baby. How was Steve? Was Steve away? Was he around? Was When I lost Sonny, Steve was in Iraq, and I didn't get a choice. The person who looks after me 
I told my friend about losing the baby, and she told her husband, who happened to be my, it's, they look after you while your husband's away. It's your, like, point of contact, they call it. Yeah. He went straight into work and told the boss that I'd lost the baby. And Mm. Steve was due home in two weeks, so I was just not going to tell him. I was just going to sort it out myself and tell him when he got home. Because when your husband is out there, the last thing you want them doing is worried about you. Yeah. You want them keeping their head down. Yeah. Shut up. Keep your head down. Focus. Get mm. the hell out of anything that comes out. Yeah. Get out, get out the way. Simple. Make sure you come home. And make sure you come home. And uh, and they told him anyway. And I had to go sit in his boss's office for a couple hours because they took him and fed him before they told him because he had to travel for three days to get back to me. So he was going to be traveling for three days while I'm at home miscarrying with a two-year-old while I'm firefighting and a Spanish au pair living with me. And he finally gets home. He got home on the Sunday. And Monday, I went into what they call cervical shock. I went into labor. And I had nine hours of full labor and then had to have an emergency evacuation because it almost killed me. So the baby got stuck. Jesus Christ, Shannon. And so all of that trauma led to me being so poorly after Nico that my hair was falling out, my teeth were breaking, I was fat, but I was malnourished. I started taking antidepressants. Um, regulating medication for me was a challenge. I'm highly sensitive. So I ha- it took me two years to regulate antipsychotic drugs from the GP. Um, I'm now on an anti-epileptic serotonin uptake inhibitor. And that has helped me immensely. Okay. But it did take a lot of research, a lot of time to figure out what worked, what didn't Mm -hmm. for my body. Um, And I was wrongly medicated for over a year. So then you've got a whole reverse, (laughs) a reverse engineering thing going on as well. Yeah. So I had to, I I was so confused about why I was sick. If I was sick because I was sick or if I was sick because I was on medicine or if I was side effects of this or was it the side effects or was it the illness what has actually happened to me and then i found out my cousin has lyme disease in america and it came from a sandbox we used to play in so they started thinking i have lyme and it's a very strong possibility Mm. not much you can do about it um so i went on a really really big health journey and i started it uh, about probably two years ago to get healthy i ran the breast cancer 5k uh pretty muddy and I was so slow and so and so large then still. I was about 20 kilos heavier than what I am right now. Wow. So I was a big girl. Fucking big, hell, that's a I was lot. In a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot bigger than I am now. Um, And I slowly got myself back to a place where I could, like, think and breathe. And then I got put on a medication that wiped me out completely. It's called Reocutane. Reocutane. It's that a skin a medication. I was having all these skin problems like eczema and all this stuff was going on. So they thought it was my sebum count. So they gave me this medication. And within two months, I was suicidal. And it's the only medication that's not an opiate, apparently, that can have this effect. It's very rare. It's an adverse reaction and you're to report it straight away. So I report this and they're like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do I want to do? You're the doctor here. I want to carry on. I I want my skin to not be blistered as heck anymore. Um, So what do we do? And so I carried on. I finished the course. But I had serious side effects from that course of medicine that took a long time to repair. Um, And unless you have serious, serious skin problems, I would not ever do that again. Mm. And and it damaged all my fingernails. They all snapped and broke off. My mm. face peeled. My skin is still very bad. I mean, literally, it, if I brushed it with a towel, my face would peel off and I would have cuts and scrapes and really awful medication. And then I started the the other medications at sort of the same time and I didn't know what was making me sick. And only recently I've made huge, huge changes. So I did a lot of therapy. I've done therapy since I was like 10. Um, and the one that was the most effective so far has been hypnosis. And then I learned to hypnotize myself. And that is very, very powerful. Um, And then I started learning the Hoff method. Yeah, Wim Hof, yeah. Wim Hof, breathing and cold exposure. Because I was always terrified of the cold and wet. I don't like it. I'm not a Seattle or England kind of girl. Mm. I'm a tropical. You didn't like that whale's water. No, gross. And then. But then the. the, Yeah, the cold method works really well, actually, um, for the inflammation. Yeah, it's amazing for inflammation. Yeah, I do cryotherapy for that reason, yeah. And I just realized that actually 
it triggered something in my body and my mind, this cold exposure. And then I slept all night in minus five in this old dodgy hotel that the heat was out. And I've never been so cold in all my life. Mm -hmm. And it was so intense. It took me a few days to recover my nervous system. Mm. Um, and then I've been doing the Buteco Clinic breathing treatment as well. Okay, I'm not so familiar with that. It's called Close Your Mouth. Well, I need to do that quite often, actually. I'm a better talker than I am a listener. So just nasal breathing. It is, but it's specific and it's specific counts as well. And it's about controlling the CO2 absorption mm. and the oxygen absorption. Mm -hmm. And you do your counts and and that really helps me focus and that really helped me with a lot of my symptoms actually so my symptoms were like allergies extreme allergies extreme skin rashes anaphylaxis asthma um and i would get hives and they would travel all the way up my body to my throat and get itching in my throat and sneezing fits mm. and blisters in my nostrils from so much congestion and rubbing my eyes until they were watering and they said I had a dust mite allergy, a really bad dust mite allergy. So I got rid of all the carpets. I got rid of everything. And I discovered that I was a mouth breather for my PT. I just read um, James Nestor's book, Breath, this year, or late last year, or beginning this year. And yeah, that nasal breathing and mouth breathing, I mean, it's literally changed the shape of our skulls, the way our teeth are aligned and everything. Being a mouth breather is linked to so much autoimmune stuff and cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your nose is your body's filter. Mm. And I wasn't filtering anything. I was taking everything straight in. Mm. All the dirt. I'm out digging. I'm out digging up rat dens out on the farm. And I'm out, you know, I, I renovated a 100-year-old house. So I'm sanding, dusting, plastering, ripping insulation out the whole lot. And the whole time I'm mouth breathing and sucking everything up pretty much instead of filtering it. Mm. So I end up with these horrific allergies for four years. And we can't get to the bottom of why I'm sick. And then I'm sick. I'm crying because I'm sick. I'm tired. I'm in pain. And something just happened. And I just said, enough is enough. And I went vegan overnight. And I've been vegan and... It has helped dramatically. Um, and then I did more research about being vegan and curing fibro because they tried to say it was fibro at one point. And I was like, you know what? You've tried to say it's Lyme. You've tried to say it's diabetes. You have no concrete answers. Every test is negative. Mm. I have nothing wrong with me. So I need to figure this out. So I went to a holistic plan of natural medicine, mushrooms, um, particularly lion's mane to try and heal. I had two spinals with both kids. I had a spinal. So one of them was a failed spinal as well with Nico. Um, I had to go under general anesthetic because they couldn't get a spinal in. Oh. So when I had my emergency C-section with my two pound baby, I went under general anesthetic for that. Um, and general anesthetic can trigger over 1,500 metabolic conditions, mm. genetic metabolic conditions. So mm. I could have any one of those. And basically the immunologist at this point said, stop looking for the cause. Yeah. The cause is your seated history. Yeah. Likely drug use in the womb. Likely poor nutrition as a child. I know I was a malnourished child. Mm -hmm. um, poor nutrition growing up. My stepmother, God bless her, she's a lovely lady, but she cooked fried chicken. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was delicious, but <laughs> the nutritional content of, course, of yeah. fake mashed potato and fried chicken is not the same as the things I eat today, mm -hmm. like sweet potatoes and hummus and mm. persimmons. You know, it's just not the same thing. Mm. Um, and then particularly everything we grow, we eat ourselves: Lettuces, spinach, peas, everything, carrots, potatoes. Amazing. Um, so farm to table is super important for us and foraging. And so we eat mostly what we produce, what we forage or what we make. And, and going vegan, particularly, I th I'm definitely allergic to animal protein as a whole. And it is so detrimental to my body. With it. I had two eggs the other day because I was testing the theory, you know, can I have eggs yet? Mm -hmm. Can I have anything? No. The answer is no. Mm. And I feel a hundred times better. So the con and then I had acupuncture mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. which is not right for me. I think we're not going to be doing that one again. I don't think because I I had a very strange response to the acupuncture. But I am going to try other treatments. Mm. So I'm going to try anything. If I'm suffering, I will try and fix it, and I will 
find whatever it takes to do that. I think through it'll happen naturally. The people will come into my life that have the knowledge that I need to be able to cure myself. Mm. And that's what I've done over the last. So with the mushrooms years. then, so when you started to learn the knowledge with the mushrooms through the nutrition and the well-being and kind of how the body works, mushrooms start to really show themselves to be not only great for the body, for the human, but as you say, the world, the wider world. There's a guy called Terence McKenna um, who was a famous botanist, wrote a lot of books, but he's, he's famous for being this psychedelic mind and writer as he was for his botany. But mushrooms, he's he. Does he, he write about the psychedelic mushrooms? He does, but he yeah. he believed that mushrooms were an entity of themselves. That they are a life form of themselves, almost otherworldly. Like they have an intelligence and a, as you say, a community and knowing a life. They do. They communicate. Yeah. And they communicate with other species, which is very rare. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also just are so full of so many good things. So if you think about what hunter-gatherers ate years ago was an abundance of mushrooms, mm. which was their main protein source. And those mushrooms have all different things in them. So all different nutrition, all mm -hmm. different polysaccharides, all different reactions to your body. So some people can eat one mushroom and, and not another. And you can react differently to different types of mushrooms. But the general population doesn't forage. It's mm. not sustainable anymore. And the mm. mushrooms you eat at the shop are the same ones I grow. Um, you Most Brits eat button mushrooms with yeah. their full English. Mm. We'll swap those buttons out. Those are still very good for you in their own right. Any mushroom is good for you in its mm -hmm. own right. Um, all button mushrooms, all argaric species. So buttons, portobellos, cremonis, any of those that you see at the shop, the chestnuts, the mini chestnuts, mm. all of those need to be cooked. You should not be eating them raw. Um, they have acid in them. That's it's not really good for you. It's not really good for your stomach. It's, it's you got to cook those. But the ones that I grow um, have to be cooked as well. I don't grow any of those types because they grow a different method. They don't grow from wood. So all the species that I'm growing grow from wood. They're the types that bracket out from trees mm -hmm. or grow out from trees. They're sometimes top fruiting, um, and they're delicious. Like, if you go to any fine dining situation, you're going to have oyster mushrooms, you're going to have king oyster mushrooms, you're going to have shiitakes. All the Asian places use a lot of shiitakes. Yeah, like shiitakes are here about... Noodle about, bars, about, yeah. everything. Those. So the three main varieties I grow are oysters, lion's mane, and shiitake. I do grow some chestnuts and reishi. Reishi is beautiful. It's these big discs, huge discs that you can actually form and shape out of a very thick mushroom that you make tea with. And it's super ancient and medicinal. Mm. And it has... Mushrooms, the biggest part of them, I think, are the top three. Cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Mushrooms are literally a preventative of the top three killers in the world. They make your life better. Mm -hmm. And people have to wake up and realize that you can't prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. Or you can't cure cancer. You can't cure diabetes. You can't cure heart disease. But you can prevent it through healthy lifestyle choices, mm -hmm. or you can minimize mm. more yeah. whether or not you're going to get those things, mm -hmm. particularly the type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Those are controllable. Food is the main control of that. Yep. What you put in, you get out. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that I'm working with on this project, some of the main points of it are, I'm going to grow mushrooms. I'm going to try and get other people to buy mushrooms for poor people and feed poor people. So I'm working with Veg Out Lincoln to distribute our virtual boxes that will be available on the website on April 23rd. So you can go on, you can order your mushrooms, your vegetables, and you can order a virtual box for a family in need. Oh, that's amazing. What a nice touch. So we've got a pay it forward scheme and, and she runs a cafe that does all pay it forward. They get loads donated. They're working with lots and lots of people. They're trying to feed these young families that are desperate and mm. living on very little. Mm. And there are a lot of people when they do their online shopping now, particularly because of Corona, mm -hmm. who would love to add five things into another basket and mm -hmm. have it shipped somewhere. Mm -hmm. But currently there's no choice to do that. You either have to physically go in store and put your tins in a basket mm -hmm. or deliver it somewhere. 
So logistically, I've just taken that step out. Mm. Click, click, job done. You've supported that's poverty. A great, that's a great people. move. That's a great move. It's good. And then I take these mushrooms and vegetables directly to the distributor and she distributes it all. And she's been doing an amazing job. She's like me, a super confident entrepreneur woman, my age. Kids have gone to school finally. So she's out dominating in her field, in her sector of that cafe Mm -hmm. and that delivery system. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. And I got offered a Lincolnshire food partnership. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, Yeah, I'm excited about that. So they're going to help me get the word out what I'm doing. And I've applied for a market stall. So hopefully I'll get that. I won't let anyone know yet Mm -hmm. because I'm waiting for the application to go through. And I want to really have that confirmed before I say a date. The wider environment is so much. It's a nightmare at the moment, isn't it? Trying to predict. What's going to happen? What's not going to happen? I mm. I feel confidently that this is going to go through. And I'm a key worker. I'm producing food, a vast amount of food for the community. So yeah. I'm hoping that I can get an outlet to sell said food. Even if that might be my front yard with me dancing with flags yep. out there. I'm going to flag everybody down and be like, I have the mushrooms. Come and get them. I have the spinach. Come and get it. Have you met the mad American mushroom lady from up the road? <laughs> I imagine, Shannon... It's a fucking heavy job growing mushrooms, is it? Is it, a little. Is it, is it full on? Is it like it's around the clock? It's full on the scheduling, yeah. It, mushrooms work on their own time. Mm-hmm. And you can plant it as much as you like. But if you're going to get contamination, it's going to get you. And, that's that. and you can waste a whole run on contamination. You get one tiny, tiny piece of a bacteria or another spore from another mold into your agar plate and then that grows out into your mycelium and then you put that in your grain that's it and you won't notice it until it turns green and the powders come out and and then that's it you look at your grain one day and you go god i have to throw that away i have to throw that away how long a cycle is that six week cycle minimum six to 12 weeks Mm. and sometimes you don't even see your contamination until 10 weeks in oh that's got to be wounding yes i've seen people lose their entire labs In one go, over mice. They got mice in their rye, and that was it. The whole lab destroyed in one day. Hundreds and hundreds of pounds and hundreds of hours worth of work. Mm. Gone. Just like that. They ate through all the bags. It's heartbreaking. It it? is heartbreaking, and it's a lot of work, and you've got customers lined up, and you're trying to stay on track on, on, on growing in production. And I'm not just growing and producing mushrooms. I'm also running the micro market garden and direct that. I run a market garden consultancy firm so i go out and teach people what to plant where when Mm. on their plot i measure up and i can provide you with all the spreadsheets i can provide you with all the growing schedules and literally plan a personal food garden anywhere that's amazing and it's like, it's me and my husband's collective knowledge over 20 years of watching Bear Grylls and reading self-sufficiency books and mm. studying and practicing and physically doing it is the biggest part of it. Mm. You learn more by, f- I've learned more over physically planting and growing things over the last 10 years than I read out of any of the books, quite frankly. Well, I feel like Field your, work. your story today has been so much of your energy and your boundless ability to, it seems to to keep going and to grow and to evolve and to adapt and to overcome is just from a willingness to get in and get on. And I love that. I think that's such a strong um, characteristic to have and something that I think hopefully people will have, I mean, what journey we've just been on. (laughs) I know, right? My journey. And I hope people take that away and, you know, people are having a tough time or, or up against adversity or in tricky situations can think actually you know we can pop our head up and give it a go you know i think the key the one key that i found was the secret that's really helped so i write down everything i want just like jim carrey just like the rest of them i've got a big mirror and a whiteboard um and a whiteboard marker mm. and i wrote down how much money i want to make a month mm-hmm. i drew a picture of a horse for my daughter i'm buying her a horse on her 16th birthday come mm-hmm. hell or high water i've made that promise i drew that picture i am doing that mm-hmm. and if you think like that all day every day and if you think that you're going to get what you want and if you think that the right people are going to come in your life it just happens mm-hmm. 
If you walk around moaning all day, every day, oh, I'm not ever going to get anything done. I'm so nervous. I'm so heartbroken. I think that's a misconception with The Secret as well. You know, I mean, I've never read it. And I like anything, you know, it's one of those, it, it sort of took a bit of a, certainly in my circles, it took a bit of a, a, pump, a hammer in because it was like, oh, you just write it down and you get it. And it's like, well, no, that, the concept mm. is you write it down and you work your ass off. To and get then it. you get it. And that's the key. The key is, is that, you know, you're taking the time to put that yeah. foresight in, in, in paper, on paper, in a notebook, wherever it is, you're putting it there and you're working towards it. It's not just a fleeting thing. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You no, are, you, are you have to grafting. take those baby steps to get there. You have to graft, like you said, and mm. those baby steps are the grafting and the hurdles are there and they're going to be there for anything you pursue. Mm. But you just go right through them. You knock them down when you get to them. You don't worry about it. You worry about the angle. I once read something that said, stop worrying about how much money you're spending and worry about how much money you're making and you'll be far wealthier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you focus on being tight and mm -hmm. you focus on the negative, that's mm -hmm. all you're going to have. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on earning, you're going to bring money in mm -hmm. all the time. And it's not going to matter what you're spending because you're covering it all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Put your energy where you want to see the results. Mm -hmm. That's the key to That's this. That's good advice. Is, and being a mum as well in a family and you've got your kids, your two kids, you know, and you're, you're a hands-on mum by all accounts. And Oh, yeah, 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 so especially with the little one. You've got like a real juggling act of applying. Spinning plates, we call it. Yes. We are spinning plates, me and my husband both. Um, well, you're living life, aren't you? You know, you're absolutely. independent. We're you're on your own steam. Packing in as much as we can, too, because Corona taught us that. Corona mm. taught us how li like life is so fleeting and the things that you used to enjoy. You take for granted. You really take for granted. So, yeah, mm. we really pack it in full. So we have the Mushroom Farm, the Market Garden, Market Garden Consultancy, events. I've got a DJ and a full DJ setup and face painting mm -hmm. that I like to take to events and host events. Mm-hmm. Um, we're hoping to be hosting some American re or ladies spiritual retreats. And the first group of girls that I'd like to work with is the, a group, an American group of girls that are here that we're going to try and do some yoga, some breathing techniques, mm. some art therapy with wine and comedians. Yeah, um, I love it. Lots of little parodies and comedic things involved in it, but also lots of serious trauma work as yep. well. Most of these moms have had some sort of trauma. Most of these moms are just returning to work and want to be at their best. So even if they haven't had trauma, they're trying to optimize their life, optimize their body, optimize their output. And by having a retreat away, you can do that far better. So mm. I started doing it for myself. I started just disappearing and mm. going for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. I like to go to the Bentley because they got a pool. Yeah. And I will spend two days in there by myself. I will eat in the restaurant and I will go for a swim every morning. And that's all I do. Just meet her. Yeah. Just be with you. Just be with me. No kids pestering me. No husband pestering me. Nothing. Quiet. Mm. And and I do that probably once every two months to yeah. Bounce back and refresh and reset. Mm. And when you're like me, so I started a startup five years ago after leaving the fire brigade. And I had to do so much work and learn so much so very fast. And it was intense. And I worked seven days a week again. And I was working all these crazy hours. And I wasn't really working. A lot of it was studying, learning my trade, mm. and then actioning it. Um, and when you're doing a startup, the hours blur. When mm. are you working? When are you not working? Mm. You're always working. You're working from home. You're always on a call. You're always on a screen. You're always talking to a customer or on a course. Mm. Um, and so I did all these courses. I did like Microsoft Office. I learned how to do my taxes. I did Excel, level three. I did a diploma in digital marketing all in three years. Mm. While my husband did his degree mm. and worked full time. And we had two kids. Amazing, man. It can be done, people. It can be done. It was hard. It was hard. Oh, my God. He'd have his headphones on and be at the table studying. And I'm there cooking and texting customers at the same time mm. and yelling at the kids. Get those shoes off the floor. Mm. And, and then now it's turned into this huge enterprise. We've got the kids club where they grow a mushroom, take a picture of their first mushroom they grow, and they get a badge and certificate after um, they get videos to go along with it. So they get to see me inoculate their plates all the way through to when I send them their package, their mycelium, in a pot. And then they take their little mycelium pot and spray it with water and the mushrooms pop out. 
Oh, amazing. And it's so cute. Oh, my children will be doing that with you. I know. It's very cute. And then they get a badge and certificate sent out as soon as they show me the pictures of the mushrooms they've grown. And if it doesn't work, I just give them another one. Mm -hmm. We make it happen. We do it in secret amongst the parents to make this happen. And they get to measure them. So if you have ever grown crust with your kids, it grows fast, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Nowhere near as fast as a mushroom. Really? Nowhere near. Oh, wow. Like you will have no mushroom one day and you will have mushrooms the next day. Okay. So it's worth setting a time lapse video as well mm-hmm. because they grow so fast. It's so interesting for children. They can measure them as they grow during the day. Oh, this sounds like a great project then for my kids. It will be doing this with and you. And they're called the Mushy Mushketeers. Oh, I love it. And they're very cute. It's a very cute little setup. And there's going to be all different price points too. And then there'll be a virtual option as well. So you'll be able to buy a kit for a kid that can't afford a kit. Mm-hmm. And they're going to range from 15 to 45 pounds. Mm-hmm. A 45 pound kit gets a glass plate instead of a plastic plate. Mm-hmm. They get a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. They get extra goodies in with their more mm-hmm. expensive ones. So we've got all the t-shirts and pencils. We've got Folgate Farm pencils because I wanted a product that would remind people of my company, but that was eco-friendly and usable. So these kids right now are doing a ton of stuff at school, mm-hmm. lots of reading and writing. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's a little something cute to put in their kit so they can take notes on their little mushrooms. Mm-hmm. So a little notepad and a little pencil for their little kid. You've got it nailed. And I, I now do. need to ask you what happened with the comic. Where's the comic at? It is coming along. Yeah, we'll have our first five pages for opening day. It's going to be a five page comic available on subscription and it's going to be a few quid a month. Mm. Um, It's going to be the story of the Fantastic Five. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be all about how I started growing mushrooms and I, uh, I ate some mushrooms and that awesome lady that yelled at me about the mushrooms is going to be one of my first villains in the comic. Perfect. Perfect. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and I'm a superhero, and I've got a costume for being a superhero and everything. Yeah. And my whole family are these little, uh, like, eco-warrior superheroes trying to save the people mm-hmm. from the trauma and disease and addiction and trying to save the planet at the same time. I love this. I and so this. the whole comic book is about that and how we got together and how we, we sort of started creating this movement with the mushrooms. And, and we started re- writing silly mushroom songs. Uh, yes, you've written, yeah. I did. Am I going to sing the mushroom song? Give us today? a mushroom song. Okay. God, I'm so nervous. I don't sing, okay? I don't. Got, listen, I'm not a singer. All you've got to do is mean it. Do you want to grow a mushroom? I eat them every day. Production silver do, the substrate is in poo, mycelium got thrown away. We used to be meat lovers, but now we're not. Please let me tell you why. Do you want to grow a mushroom? It doesn't have to be a mushroom. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> Come on. You, my my friend Shannon, are an all rounder. <laughs> so that's for the comic book and the kids club and the subscription. And I'm bringing the lab to my market stall so that kids can actually cut up agar with scalpels and transfer. Oh, cool! And clone mushrooms on site. Wow! I'm gonna teach them how to clone mushrooms on site. How that's cool amazing. That? That's yeah. amazing. It's so simple, and I can do it right there for the children. Which is fantastic. And I used to run a toddler group on the base for years and years. I was a volunteer and running bumps to babies. And I ran the Lincolnshire. I'm currently the chair of the Lincolnshire Ladies Rounders League. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not really doing much with that. So if anyone hears this in Lincolnshire, I'd like to be the chair of the Lincolnshire Ladies Rounders League. I'm no longer interested. (laughs) Although I still want to play. And I do have amazing captains. You need like another six days in the week. You do. I do. I do. And I'm volunteering to create a micro market garden for a charity in Louth on Thursday. Actually, Mm -hmm. I'm getting a young man with mental health things going on started gardening to help him. Amazing. So I'm doing that as a volunteer, and then we're going to see where we go from there. I'm working with a really cool person down in Louth to mm-hmm. see if they can turn five acres into a community garden, mm-hmm. uh, similar to what I'm doing here in Waddington. Um, and then I finally found a premises that I think I'm actually going to get accepted on a lease for because all of the lovely men of Lincolnshire have rejected my leases. They don't want me to grow mushrooms in their buildings. 
They don't want the crazy American mushroom lady. They don't. Or they think that I'm a drug dealer, which uh, I'm not. Yeah, so much association whole, of magic mushrooms. I have rainbow hair and then magic mushrooms, even though this is food. Yeah. Um, or it's out of my budget, or it doesn't have the right class of use on it, mm -hmm. and there is just nothing. There's nothing for a blossoming mushroom farm, um, mm. except for this one lovely, amazing concrete room with nothing else in it that I found in my budget. And I'm hoping to be producing, from home, I can produce 450 kilos of mushrooms every six weeks. 450 kilos? Yeah, and I can do that in a room that is the size of your studio. Wow. Fucking hell. That's, mushrooms don't weigh a lot, so that's a lot of mushrooms, isn't that's it? That's a lot of mushrooms, but the way you do it is, it, we use such high-tech methods now that are so simple, though. Mm -hmm. It's like really simple, really technologically advanced, and you can do it in an extremely small space. Now, think about how much space it takes to feed a cow. Mm. Yeah, you A lot more than this room. Mm. And 450 kilos of, like, delicious superfood for the community. That's a lot of food. So when we look at it like that, this is a real opportunity here mm. to change what poverty-stricken people are eating, change their brain development as a result of that, give them more opportunities, give my family an opportunity to support itself. I'll be the income earner. Mm. for my family and make the world a better place at all at the same time it's great i love it I and love then it. i'm producing all those recipes so we're going to have all the recipes for my grandmother's basement available so i make jam mm. and i have my own range of jams that are not like what you get in a shop my favorite is strawberry nectarine vanilla oh which is a great strawberry jam. nectarine vanilla. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, interesting straight away. I know. Yeah, they're they're quite unique. And my grandmother taught me how to do this stuff. Um, I'm also making dips. So, no offense, British people, but your dip is bad. I don't think we do. We even do our own dip. Not really. I think we just get like mustard. We've got English mustard. English mustard's pretty cool, isn't it? That's not dip. You get those stupid little trays that have like four things in it. You have some really bad salsa. Oh, yeah. That is not like salsa. It's like a weak uh, interpretation of like some kind of Mexican so thing. Some fake guacamole and some kind of creamy stuff that I'm not really sure what you <laughs> You don't guys even know what that is. I don't even know. But the dip that I make are delicious flavors, like sun-dried tomato mushroom. Right. And you take a little packet mm. and you pour it in the mixture and you stir it up. Mm. And you leave it in the fridge overnight, and then you serve it the next day in a big bowl, people. You need a big bowl for dip, by the way. Well, um, Americans will do everything bigger than we do it. Yeah. We're very kind of modest, and like, like you said before, we're kind of a bit nervous and polite <laughs> yeah. about it, aren't we? Whereas you're like, no, just fucking do it properly. We need a scoop of dip. I need a <laughs> scoop of dip for my chip. Do you see how big this chip well, is? There's six people trying to get a fucking breadstick in a tiny little fucking sachet. Yeah. yeah, like I'm not down for that. So I'm going to start <laughs> producing those. Those will be on the, on the website. I actually have a chef cooking it for me too. Oh, cool. Um, And he is an absolutely excellent chef. Ashley, and he's going to be producing these spices and pickles. So my grandmother made bread and butter pickles is what she called them for years and years. Um, and they are full of everything that helps cure inflammation and arthritis. So like turmeric and mustard mm. seed wow, yeah. and honey. And these pickles are delicious and you put them on your sandwiches. So we'll have pickles, all, all farmy bits, you know, maybe some pies. I do like, you guys have a serious shortage of pies here that are not savory. <laughs> okay, why with the meat in the pie? Why? I need some blueberries and whipped cream with the pie. That's another American classic that I'm know, only ever aware of in films. And pe people are having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and blueberry pie. And I'm thinking... I make a mean uh, pie. We've never had that. Oh, our pies. I, the Folgate Farm pies are going to be a, something special because I, I really cracked those a few years ago, well, especially the blueberry one. Me and, like, me and Aiden and my little family, we're going to be rolling around the Folgate Farm and getting stuck into everything because I would like to meet Stephen. He sounds like a smashing lad. Your two children obviously come through powerful entry to the world, you know, and you have just taken us and these listeners and viewers and Aiden and me on a, <laughs> Dude, crazy. Rocket ride. See, I'm so shocked by this actually because you've had so many guests. So I just assumed I wouldn't be very unique to you at all. Well, you know, you're you're number one. You're an American lady, and we're it's exotic, isn't it? Because we're 
English, and I when mean, you speak to anybody, really far you, away. you know, you, you and you are a powerful American. All the women I've had on this podcast, all extremely powerful ladies. But well, you, your wife is a very powerful lady yeah, as she well. Is. She's, you she know, is. she's fierce lady and she fights for women's rights in her own right, being a doula. Yeah. And so you have this background with a woman who's also fierce. Yeah, for sure. She's, and she's, then she's, entrepreneurs and strong women appearing here. Yeah, There's, I love it. I'm Listen, I love sitting here opposite people like you. And, and, you know, as I bring this home, the journey you've just taken us on from sort of, you know, your birth trauma of your own into a family where there's murder and there's tragic loss and PTSD and drugs and abuse. And you've gone through the stages of your life and maintained a belief in yourself and a, a somehow a positive projection. So you believe that something can happen well for you. And even in your own births and all that preparation that you've made and all the things you've been through and you still struggled and had a difficult time but come through that and then to be where you are now learning about your health working on your health you know i think people watching this so many of us are struggling at the moment you know with mental health issues anxiety the lockdown you know not seeing i people. can literally feel it on yeah. everyone right now can you feel it I on feel everyone? It everywhere everywhere the it's intensity awful. uh the the anxiety mm. is in the air. People are very nervous to take any risks right now, investing in business. They're nervous very of nervous other. of each other. They're nervous of even the simplest thing, just walking down the street. Mm. And people are really snapping at each other a lot, too. Mm. So mm. take it with a pinch of salt. If somebody sure. yells at you, like, hey, these are tough times. Be like, you good? Do you need some help? Can, is there anything mm. I can do for you? I know you're yelling at me right now, but I feel like you might be projecting something mm. right now. I think you're right. And I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure people will take a lot from this, Shannon. Oh, fabulous. So, thank I hope you so. so much for your time. I'm going to go and have a fucking lie down. <laughs> what about you, Aiden? I'm starving yeah. from all the food you just talked about. I know. Well, keep your eyes sealed. April 23rd, fullgatefamilyfarm.com. Yeah. Yep. Is the we'll link everything in website. the bottom. You send yep. me all the links through. We'll get it I'll all linked all in the, at the bottom. All the links on for Veg Out. If you guys want to support any of the charities we're supporting, we support three different things right now. Feeding the homeless. Tough Enough to Care. Tough Enough to Care is a huge men's mental health charity. And Fullgate Farm has a product line that's donating 10% directly to them mm -hmm. from a product line. Because my husband is military. My uncle suffered with mental health. My father suffered with mental health. Mm -hmm. All the men in my life suffered with mental health in some way. Mm -hmm. And I have to do something about that for my own son's sake. Yeah. Because he's autistic and his statistics for suffering with mental health are far greater chance. Of course. So I'm going to do whatever I can in that field. Mm -hmm. The other field is I am personally sponsoring mothers to have private one-on-one -on -one training around raising their neurodivergent children because I took a very specialist course um, from a wonderful woman, Julia Harris, and I would not be skilled, patient, or clever enough to raise my son if it weren't for her. Mm. She took 30 plus years of collective knowledge in her fields and taught it to me over an eight week course, w like directly one on one hours and hours of tuition that no mother gets in this country for their disabled children. Mm. Um, and it gave me the tools and skills and knowledge around the brain development, particularly of my son, to be able to meet his needs and go from seven hour screaming fits to 45 minutes. So we're supporting her and we're paying for people to get this training. Any mothers that are desperate with um, Julia Harris. So I'll give you the links for that. Yeah, and amazing. those are the three charities that we support. And I support them through individual product lines. They each get a bit of what's going mm. on at the Folgate farm. And I still get to make money as well. And the reason I'm not going full charity is because it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Really, what's beneficial to the community is everyone making money. So I'm also hiring. As soon mm. as I'm a, a, able to, I will be hiring locally. Mm for anyone to come in and start growing mushrooms and start distribution. And that's really important too. So mm. the full gate from lunch is keep your eyes peeled. Keep your, I've sure. got lots of mushrooms growing, lots of different varieties, lots of vegetables growing. Um, big events planned. Fourth of July will be an event. And I'm looking at maybe the August. We're looking at mm. um, trying to bring Carnival oh. to Lincoln. Oh, well, listen, I'm sure you will 
you will manifest magic. We're manifesting and we're trying. We're talking about it. it obviously, things are up in the air with Corona. Can yeah. we bring an event that size here? Mm -hmm. Can we get the people interested? People are still scared of each other. Yep. But I'm looking at Silver Street for the high street for the autumn for August at the earliest for running a big event for my first time running something of that size. Mm -hmm. I run events anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I host American Thanksgiving too. Oh, wow. Every year for everyone. That's cool. As many people as I can fit. Educating the Brits on the Thanksgiving as well. No, I mostly, I invite all the American expats. Oh, okay. And their partners. So usually it's like one American and then one Brit. I see. Or they have their children in America mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Yeah, so Some kind of link. So yeah, we'll be hosting lots and lots of events through the year. Posting lots of things on the website. And that's, I think that's it actually. Is let's, that even possible? Did let's get, all go and have a lay down. Can I get to 2021? <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. From 1985 to 2021. You've been beautiful. <laughs> Thank You've you for wonderful. having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peace, my darling.